This is our sixth annual Women in STEM event. We have symposium, we have four sessions where the girls have a more intimate setting with a professional talking about a specific topic, followed by a luncheon where there are six or seven girls at a table with a professional woman in a technical field as the host. Our girls in engineering, math, and science, what we call our gems here at Cabrillo, uh, decided to add a women empowerment symposium. The students are here hours upon hours, um, especially over the past few weeks, making sure all the little details are perfect uh, and decorating the room to creating the posters uh, to even coming up with the topics and the theme of this year is equality stems from within. I am an alumni. I'm happy to be back here. I used to plan this when I was in high school. I never really got to see people like me in the industry I wanted to be a part of. So being able to come back here and kind of motivate them and show them that it is possible, just having that idea to not to make it seem that it's not only a dream, it's a reality, it's something important that I wish I would have had. I want them to know that they can do it if they set their mind to it. They have to remain motivated and find that passion within them, find that thing that makes them want to achieve their dreams. When I was their age, I remember wanting to be an engineer just because people told me I was good at math and science, but I didn't really know what that looked like. So I think it's really helpful and powerful to be able to connect with students and show them this is what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis to allow them to make the decision of whether they're super interested in that field or maybe want to look elsewhere. What I'm really impressed with is that how serious our uh, young ladies are coming to this event today. They're dressed as if this is a job interview. They know this is something about their future. Kudos to the Cabrillo team for organizing all this work and really making a seamless presentation of really taking advantage of these great role models that they get to hear today. Our goal for this year was that equality truly does stem from within, that these girls feel empowered, that they can do whatever that they choose to do with their life. Good morning, Cabrillo community, to our annual Women in STEM event. I'm Wendy Poffenberger, the proud principal of Cabrillo High School. 
And this morning on International Women's Day, I have the distinct honor of welcoming everyone, including our guest speakers, our panelists, and our incredible staff who worked so hard to put this event together for our future leaders and innovators, our Cabrillo students. We thank you for being with us today. We hope you enjoy your time and walk away inspired. And now I'm happy to introduce our fearless leader, teacher extraordinaire, and organizer of the seventh annual Women in STEM event, Mr. Ken Fisher. Thank you, Dr. Poffenberger, and welcome everybody. Let me share my screen here really quick. Thank you for joining us for this year's Cabrillo High School Women in STEM event, Define, Challenge, and Empower. Today is International Women's Day, a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. This day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. This day, March 8th, is a glorious day of celebration, a day in which young women around the world have the opportunity to walk in the paths of women who have been paving a road for your success, a road in which they do not want you to simply follow, but a road for you to lay more bricks pour more asphalt, and create more exits for others to take after you. A road that leads you to the places that you have dreamt about going, a road that leads you to the career that helps you change this world we live in, a road that helps you to become the person you want to be. Welcome to the Women in STEM event 2021. In keeping in tradition of our all-girl ROTC team, showing the presentation of colors of the United States and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, we ask that you read to yourself and follow whatever honor you choose to give. Raina Duncan will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. We cannot keep this event running without generous support from many companies. The staff here at Cabrillo High School would like to give thanks to our supporters of the 2021 Women in STEM event. Thank you to ACOM, Honda, the Power of Dreams, the United States Space Force, Cabrillo Engineering and Design, United for Youth, Manifesting Dreams and Goals into Reality, Custom Inc. for your wonderful artwork and donation to help our Gems of Cabrillo find their dreams in STEM. There are two companies that have continuously supported what we have done here at Cabrillo High School for numerous years. A big thank you to Matson Navigation for your continued support for all seven years that Cabrillo High School Women in STEM event has been, been inspiring the girls of Cabrillo High School to reach for the stars that will guide them through the oceans of their lives. Thank you to Marathon Petroleum Corporation. Your support continues to change so many lives here on the west side of Long Beach. We are gonna ask for the students, if you can please sit there and post, I know it's your cameras aren't on. I know that you're sitting there <laughs> thinking, wow, this is kind of cool so far, uh, but we would really love to see pictures of you on our social media. So I'd like to say thank you to all the students who are here joining us today from Cabrillo High School and all the high schools of Long Beach Unified School District and really across this nation. Please follow us on Twitter at CED Jags or on Instagram at Cabrillo Engineering. And we encourage you throughout this event to please take pictures and post them on social media and using the hashtags that we have listed here. A little bit about the history of this Women in STEM event. The Women in STEM event started as a dream for three Cabrillo girls who were inspired by the Port of Long Beach's Women in Trade event back in 2014. Gabriela Gonzalez, Madeline Salud, and Angel Lamsam developed a plan to create an event that would have two goals, inform the girls of the opportunities in STEM careers and empower the girls to study STEM in college. The girls took on the challenge to send out more than 100 letters and emails inviting engineering and tech companies in the local area to have lunch with our female students and talk about what it takes to make it in a STEM career. Their mantra, rise above, was the very first theme of the first annual Women in STEM event. The goals that we have here to create and present an engaging and inspirational words of advice from professional women who have succeeded in this STEM path. 
and introduce students of Cabrillo High School to mentors who can guide and encourage them to pursue STEM for college and career. We also wanna create confidence in collaborating with other people. We want to make, so introduce students to others who have a common career interest, introduce students to a professional who may guide and mentor them to reach their goals and make the doubt in you disappear and develop the confidence that is in each and every single one of you. Why is goal number three? To empower the gems of Cabrillo High School. To have professional women give presentations focused on positive self-image, 21st century skills, and tips for success in the post-secondary world. Give students the opportunity to talk to professional women and ask questions about their future. To provide the resources for each girl to feel encouraged to learn, to have the strength to grow, and feel empowered to reach their full potential. We're a little bit ahead of time, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, Dr. Ashley Williams, are you ready to go? We're about eight minutes ahead of schedule. I do apologize. I am ready. Sounds good. Then we are going to let the workshops begin. Let me introduce you to Dr. Ashley Moore Williams. She leads a modeling and simulation group for an R&D project in the tech industry. In this role, her team develops engineering software tools and performs analysis to provide insight for developing projects. Previously, she worked in a number of roles at the Aerospace Corporation, most recently serving as director of the studies and analysis office. Passionate about developing the development of future engineers, she previously taught an introductory MATLAB course at the University of Southern California and orbital mechanics at California State University, Long Beach. Dr. Williams studied aerospace engineering and applied mathematics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She also has a master's degree in aerospace engineering and PhD in control and dynamical systems from the California Institute of Technology. Dr. Ashley Williams, it is an honor to have you to here to join us today. The stage is now yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, I will share my screen one second. Let me get this set up. One second, I'm having some technical difficulties as is common with these things. Yeah. Mr. Carrillo, do you have my presentation? Would you be able to? Um, share it. Yes, give me one moment. I think I have, uh, it's, the problem is it's not wanting to let me share Keynote, which is what I'm using. So I'm trying to share it okay. as a PDF. Let me try that. I don't see that. Yeah, I think if you're able to share it, that would be really helpful. Give me just a moment. Okay. All right, here you go. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll prompt you on when to change the slides. Good. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here with you all. Uh, I'm super passionate about STEM um, and encouraging young women like you to pursue STEM careers. Uh, so thank you for spending this time with me. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers. I think this is a really wonderful event, uh, and I've been participating for several years now, and I'm always super impressed uh, with what they managed to put together, so thank you. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So this morning, we're going to talk about defining yourself, and I want you to think about some key questions. So first, who are you? What motivates you? Uh, what are your core values? Uh, if you thought about that a little differently, um, what is fundamentally important to you? And then what do you want? Uh, with the answers to those questions, uh, you can set goals and challenge yourself and then empower yourself. So to help you through this process, I'm going to tell you my story, how I got into STEM and how I define myself. 
Growing up, I loved math and science, but I also really loved English and history and the arts. Uh, you know how some kids seem just destined to be engineers? They're those kids that are always taking things apart and putting them back together. I was not that kid. I did not scream, ooh, she's going to be an engineer. But I was super fascinated by space and I really wanted to work for NASA. But I didn't think I was smart enough to be an engineer. But one day my high school calculus teacher pulled me aside and he told me that I was really good at math. Up to that point, it hadn't really occurred to me, but that one comment from him set me on the path that I'm on today. Next slide, please. So as Mr. Fisher mentioned in my introduction, uh, I attended college at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I decided to give aerospace engineering a shot. I didn't really know what to expect, uh, but my first semester I worked really hard and I did well. I, I surprised myself, honestly, uh, especially in my Calc 3 class. Along the way, a professor pulled me aside again and told me I was really good at math. And she also encouraged me to add another major in applied mathematics and to eventually pursue a PhD. I followed her advice on both counts and headed off to grad school at Caltech, where I first earned a master's degree in aerospace engineering and then a PhD in control and dynamical systems. And you know what? I ended up working at NASA, uh, specifically at JPL. I did two internships there and I collaborated with JPL engineers for my PhD research on space trajectory optimization. Next slide. So I started my career at the Aerospace Corporation as an analyst in the controls analysis department. Uh, I developed simulations of satellite control systems. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Aerospace Corporation is a federally funded research and development center uh, that works uh, closely with the government. Uh, in particular, aerospace works with the Air Force um, and they provide technical guidance to ensure success of their missions and projects. Over time, I worked my way into management, which was something I really wanted. Um, and I worked in a lot of different roles, but they all focused on modeling, simulation, and analysis of space systems. I worked there for seven and a half years, and I fully intended to spend my entire career there. I, I really loved it. I loved the people. I loved the projects. I was so fulfilled, and I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. Um, and over my time there, I really built up my confidence, my professional confidence in my ability to tackle hard problems. But life uh, has a tendency to throw curveballs, and my husband was recruited by a company in the Bay Area. So together, we made the decision to make this huge pivot to switch industries from aerospace and defense uh, to tech, and we moved from Los Angeles to the Bay Area. I spent several months job searching until I found an amazing role uh, at Apple. It was during that process that I really had to define myself and my skills. At first, it was really tricky to get interviewers and recruiters to really see what I could do and how my aerospace engineering skills and background could translate to a totally different industry or set of problems. I really had to understand who I was and the value that I bring, and most importantly, what I wanted. I interviewed at startups and big companies for a lot of different roles, but it was the, the job at Apple that felt right. Uh, I've been in that job for two years now. Uh, I work on an R&D project. I manage a small team of analysts, data scientists, and software developers. Um, and we build simulation tools to perform analysis to assess and guide this technology and development process. Uh, I was joking with a colleague the other day about really how hard our work is, um, and he was pointing out the impact of my work and how people look to me like, okay, is this really going to work? What do you think? Um, and that's a lot of pressure, uh, but it's amazing. And it's really gratifying to look at my work and see the impact and the influence that it has. So I really love this job. It's incredible. Uh, and it is hard. Sometimes it can be very stressful and there's a lot of pressure, but it's only because I know myself and I trust the skills that I have built up over my entire career that I'm able to stand up to that pressure and to perform under that pressure. So next slide, please. It's not always easy to understand ourselves. So let's talk about that. Uh, I once had a really great mentor who asked me, what do you want out of life? And how does your career fit into that? So I want you to think about two fundamental questions. The first is, what is important to you in life? What do you want your life to look like? For me, I want to spend quality time with my family, my pets, and my friends. I really want to highlight my pets here. 
Uh, you can see their pictures there. I'm obsessed with my pets. As I'm speaking, I have one of my dogs is in my lap and my other dog is sitting right next to me. Um, so getting to spend time with them is really important to me. Uh, I also want to travel. My husband and I travel all over the place and we're so lucky to be able to do that. It's a bit harder this year, uh, but I look forward to doing that again. I want financial security. I am not afraid to say that I want to make money because money is security and it is freedom and it brings opportunity. And I am striving for that in my life. Um, I also want to live a joyful life. I want to spend my days doing work that is meaningful to me and to others. So some of the things you might think about here uh, for yourself is where do you want to live? Do you want a family? Do you want to buy a home one day? Uh, do you want to be active in your community? Do you want to be able to, to give back? Um, it's funny, when I first moved to the Bay Area, I was really missing LA, and I was thinking about these ideas, like what, what matters to me in my day-to-day -day life? And I told my husband that all I really need was him, our pets, and Netflix. Uh, at the time, I had no idea how prescient that would be, and over the past year, that I, how lucky I am that that's, that's how I feel about my life, and that as long as I have, have those things, that, that I'm okay. So now, the second question is, what is important to you in a job? This is actually my favorite interview question to ask candidates, and it tells me a lot about who they are and whether or not they'd be successful on my team. So for me, I want to learn and I want to be challenged. I never want to stop learning. I always want to keep advancing my skills and getting better and better at what I do. I also want to do something that matters. The mission and the impact of it really means a lot to me. And then finally, I want to work with passionate, generous, and collaborative people. You know, we spend so much of our time at work. I want to work with good people. And for me, so much of my socialization comes from interacting with my colleagues. So that's especially important. Uh, so next slide, please. Oh, I had another comment there. Uh, so some of the things you might want to think about. Do you want a job that's hands-on? Do you want to work with hardware? Do you want to do experiments? Do you want to be in a lab? Or maybe you're more of an abstract thinker and you want to spend your day on the computer writing code and doing analysis like I do. Uh, do you like working by yourself or do you like to really collaborate with people? Those are a number of things that you would want to think about. Okay, now next slide. Uh, so that brings us to um, thinking more about ourselves. So there's a series of questions. The first, who are you? What makes you special? What are you good at? Uh, and then who do you want to be? Uh, if you think about what do you want to be better at? What do you want to change? What do you want to learn? And then how do you want to be seen? Uh, we don't always see ourselves that clearly um, or the way that other people do. So if you were to have a friend, somebody who knows you well, describe you to somebody else, what do you want them to say? So if you go to the next slide, that brings us to the idea of the three words. And so we want to pick three words that define you and can help guide you as you make decisions about your life and career. So go to the next slide. I'm gonna share my three words with you. And my three words are mentor, performer, and analyst. And I'm now going to explain what each one means to me. So next slide. For mentor, uh, throughout my career, there are people who have had an incredible impact on my life and in shaping who I am today. These are people who believe in me and they encourage me. They challenge me. They uplift me when I'm struggling and they celebrate with me when I'm thriving. Mentoring has been so meaningful to me. I strive to do it for others. Uh, there are different ways that this manifests in my life. Um, and the first is as a teacher. Um, I had an awesome opportunity over about six years to teach uh, part-time at Cal State Long Beach and at USC, uh, teaching either orbital mechanics or MATLAB. And it was such a wonderful experience. I really love working with students and I really appreciate being able to share my perspective as somebody who works in the industry to tell students like, this is what really mattered when I got in a job, or this is what you need to focus on learning uh, as a student. And it was actually through that teaching that I got involved with this event. Uh, one of the board members here, Victor Lukin, uh, he was my student at Cal State Long Beach. And so he recruited me to come and participate uh, in the uh, Industry Women Luncheon. Uh, and I started doing that back in 2016. Um, so as I'm sure you see, teachers really shape the future. And I want to highlight Mr. Fisher here. I, I think that Mr. Fisher is to all of you what my high school calculus teacher was to me. 
that I see what he and the other teachers are achieving with this program that he is setting so many future engineers on their path. And I think that's just amazing. Now, why I think that is important is because we want to change what STEM looks like. I can't tell you how many meetings I sit in where I am the only woman in the meeting. And so I am really excited for the day when it is not remarkable to be a woman in STEM, when we just expect that there will be half the people in the room will be women. And I'm, I'm really excited for that to happen. So along those lines, um, I'm really passionate about STEM outreach. Um, and that's because it's hard to imagine being something you can't see. So role models are really important. And so I want to share the joy and the possibility of a STEM career with the next generation um, to encourage and inspire so that hopefully somebody else will give it a try and prove to themselves that they can do it just like I did myself many years ago. Uh, that top photo there is from this actual event back in 2016. Uh, and the lower picture is from a program I led at the Aerospace Corporation geared towards our interns and making sure that they had a really successful intern experience. The last column there uh, is about what I do at work. Um, so I worked really hard to become a manager and I really enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy developing the careers of my employees and helping to shape the culture of our team. I also work hard to support my colleagues and to help them succeed. Um, and I mentor earlier career employees who don't report to me, you know, help them to navigate how to be an engineer and how to interact with their boss and, and you know, what do you do in meetings, that sort of thing. And when I think about my own success, I picture myself standing on the shoulders of giants, those who came before me and who shared 40 years of knowledge with me so that I could start my career with these nuggets of knowledge that it took them a lifetime to acquire. Some people succeed in life by stomping on others or clawing their way to the top. That's not me. I prefer to succeed by supporting and championing others. It's so much more joyful to succeed together than alone. And I find that when I support others, they support me right back. Because I do this for my colleagues, when I need something, they're there for me. And they pick up the ball if I'm about to drop it. I, I really appreciate that. Okay, next slide. So my next word is performer. Um, one of the really key and influencing factors in my life is that my mom was a high school theater teacher. And she is my single greatest teacher and influencer in my life. Um, and she instilled in me a love for theater and performance. And I grew up on the stage. I still remember the overwhelming joy I felt the first time I performed at a high school musical and I heard the audience erupt in applause at the end of the opening dance number. And while I was very involved in theater and choir throughout high school, one day at rehearsal, I realized that I was eager to get off the stage and back to my math homework, which I was doing between scenes. That was a real light bulb moment for me and a big reason I pursued engineering as a career. I realized that I got really lost in doing math and the time just flew by and it was what I wanted to be doing. But I still loved performing and I really need performance in my life. So I found a way to view te technical presentations as a performance. Even this today is a performance. Um, so this might surprise you, but engineers spend a lot of time putting together and giving technical presentations. It's probably the number one thing that I do. Um, so when I'm talking about complex mathematical equations and abstract concepts, I focus on telling a story. Uh, oftentimes I will actually write a script and then I perform it. And while that doesn't work for everybody, uh, it definitely works for me. And honestly, I feel the same high I got performing before that musical theater audience when I do a good job sharing technical information with my colleagues. I'll share a particular story. Uh, when I was at aerospace, I had the opportunity to present to the board about a technical issue that had been 40 years in the making. I've never been so nervous in my life, but I got up there and I told this rather epic story. Uh, the board included some very accomplished people and when I finished, they applauded. Uh, I actually got a high five from a former ambassador who was on the board and a thumbs up from a former astronaut and a retired four-star general. And I later learned that the board doesn't applaud, that that was really rare for that to happen, that it's only happened maybe two or three other times in, in the history of the Aerospace Corporation. 
And so I think that speaks to the fact that I was telling a story. They were engaged and invested in the outcome of it. So engineering is hard and it's very important to be able to communicate the nuance of technical problems. What is happening and why and why does it matter? And so to do that successfully, the information has to be accessible. You know, when you're sharing a problem you've worked on with other people, you've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but the other people haven't. So you have to give them an entry point to understanding it. Um, and so because of my theater experience, now presenting is one of my greatest strengths and it has contributed a lot to my success as an engineer. Okay, next slide. So my final word is analyst. And this is fundamentally who I am as a professional. I can look at complex data and equations and extract meaning and insight. And I am really good at math. It took me a long time to be able to own that fact and feel like I could actually say it, but I am. I'm also creative. Um, I really focus on making cool plots and animations to help people understand what is happening. And I can take these big problems and break them into small pieces that can actually be solved. And then as I pointed out on the last slide, I can take that complex technical information and present it in a way that is understandable and enables people to make decisions based on that information. The best compliment I ever got from my boss was that he didn't hire me because of my specific knowledge or experience. He hired me because I could think. And the value there is that I can solve problems I haven't seen before. And I trust that because I've done it before, I can do it again and I can do it again. And that no matter how hard the problem is, I will be able to tackle it. And so next slide. So now it's your turn. Uh, you were given this card. Um, and so I want you to think about who are you? What do you want? And then how would you define yourself in your own three words? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and do you have any questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so I can pull open my chat here. And we do have a couple questions. Um, uh, first question is, what type of simulations in Apple did you work on? Um, so that's a good question. I mean, fundamentally, the simulations are of physics. So, you know, we're modeling physics of something. I can't tell you what that something is. Um, but we do a lot of analysis. Uh, I personally do a lot of analysis in MATLAB. Um, I do some where we write our own code in Python. Um, we have a very big simulation we're building at the moment that's written in C++. That's what's called a software in the loop simulation. And so this combines a physics simulation with actual software. So, you know, software takes in data from sensors or other pieces of information and then does something. So we simulate what would be sent into the software. And it's a way to test out the software and make sure that everything's working the way we think it will. So, but a lot of it is writing our own custom tools. Excellent. Another question is, what was the biggest mental struggle you had as a student? <sighs> Thinking I was good enough. It took me a really long time to build up the confidence that I could really do it. Um, and so as a result, I always worked really, really hard because I was trying to, to prove it to myself. But, um, you know, every class was challenging. It was never easy for me. And honestly, I really think that that was a benefit because, because it was always hard. It doesn't scare me when things are hard. And so I built up a resilience to that difficulty, uh, which I think has made a big difference in my ability to keep doing that. Especially as we get older, a lot of students, you guys might have these questions because many are coming in about talking about stress. Um, and, and really, as you get older and you start to accomplish more, you start to deal with more problems, that mental stress really starts to, you can handle it a lot better. So I'm going to ask you, though, right now, Jenny Topete is asking, what would you say is the most stressful part of your job right now? Um, so the most stressful thing can be um, working under pretty tight deadlines of having to turn around answers very quickly. Sorry, my dog is, um, she's barking. Shh, shh. Um, so, and it has to be right. Sometimes I'm the only person in the middle of the night writing code and doing analysis and then presenting that uh, result to a large group of people 
Um, and it's on me to be right. And so that's, that's the scariest part. Uh, hang on, this little one is not happy about something. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's what's most stressful is just the pressure of if I'm wrong. <laughs> There's somebody outside and she's, she's very protective. I'm, my dog is right there, same place. Um, uh, uh, how long did you attend school before where you are right now? So I went to school for nine years. So I did four years at, at CU Boulder doing my double major. And then it was a year for my master's and then another four for my PhD. Excellent. Um, Kara Kotor is asking, when you moved from aerospace to Apple, what really called you or inspired you to work for Apple instead of aerospace? And she said, by um, the way, you did an amazing job with this presentation, she said. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, that was... Um, a hard decision. And I think it's that I had built this experience in aerospace and I love the industry, but I was just interested to see, is there something else out there? Is there a way I could grow and do something totally different? Um, and I ended up getting my job. It was honestly through networking, um, that somebody I had gone to college with worked with who is now my boss and had recommended me. So I knew I was going to be working with really great people. Um, and when I took the job at Apple, I did not know what I was going to work on. Um, and so I just had to kind of take a leap of faith that I wanted to try it. I wanted to prove myself to myself that I could succeed in the tech industry, which is, you know, very different in the aerospace industry. You typically are building one thing and that one thing has to work. Whereas in the tech industry, they're making millions and some of them are allowed to fail. So that is a very different dynamic in the way the work actually gets done. And I wanted to see that, that side of things. Um, and yet it's very possible. I might go back to aerospace one day. I haven't shut that door. I know when I left the aerospace corporation, I said, please, please let me come back one day. If, if that's where life brings me. So. Adrian Bayeris is asking, as you call yourself a performer, did you obtain that skills, those skills to perform over time or did it come naturally to you? Um, I mean, so I, I was definitely a performer e kid. Um, one of my favorite videos my parents have of me growing up was performing in a church, uh, like Christmas special, and I am screaming the words out. Like I knew I was two years old and I knew every word, and I was just gonna let everybody knew that I knew them. <laughs> um, so like I had the natural inclination, but it was through years and years of practice and you know, getting better at it. And then to translate it into technical presentations, I wasn't good at it at first. It's hard giving technical presentations. And it was over years of just doing it over and over again and getting comfortable in front of people. I remember the first time um, I taught that first lecture, I was shaking like a leaf. Like I was passing out the syllabus, just absolutely terrified. And so that was another thing that teaching challenged me to get that much more comfortable in front of an audience. And I remember over time, especially teaching MATLAB, it got to where I was writing code in front of the students and having to debug code in front of 50 students. And so it also helped me to just get really good at working under pressure. Uh, so I'm always looking for how can I put myself in situations that continue to challenge me and make me better. Perfect answer. Um, how did it feel interviewing for your first job and how long did it take you to find one? So my very first job was kind of unique in that while I was at Caltech in grad school, um, I would go to the career fairs and like two years before I was finished, I went to a career fair and it was Northrop Grumman actually started recruiting me and they brought me in for an interview like two years early and were like, okay, well, we'll hire you as soon as, as you're done. And I wasn't sure that that role was right for me. So um, I had a friend uh, worked at aerospace and they, they passed my resume around and I actually got a call from who ended up being my boss saying, hey, I think we have a good role that you would fit. Will you come in an interview? And so I interviewed for that position and they made me an offer. And this was like nine months before I finished my PhD. So I was able to accept that job and I knew I had a job waiting for me as soon as, as I finished. Um, it was much harder when I was interviewing than um, for this last round when I made that transition. And it was mostly making the change of trying to figure out what do I want to do and does it make sense? You know, so many recruiters just did not know what to do with me because um, a lot of what I do, at least the way it is articulated, is not done in Silicon Valley. So that was part of the challenge of helping them to understand what I could bring to the table. And that, and it took me a few months to find to find a job when I was job searching. Then, 
Um, your, your theater, I'm sure, gave you part of this, but what other uh, skills, how did you develop the skill of being so confident in STEM as a woman in STEM? Mm. Um, that was just through hard work and getting good grades and doing well on tests and having professors tell me like, you know, you're good at this. Um, but yeah, it was really just through the work um, and and producing the results and, and doing that over and over and over again to where I'm like, okay, I can do this. Was there any ever time that when you were in college uh, that even maybe when you even finished your degree that you ever doubted the fact that maybe you went into the wrong career choices or the, mm. the wrong companies? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I think like it took me a long time, even within aerospace engineering, even though I identified that early as something I wanted to do, it took me a while to figure out within aerospace engineering, what did I like? And even now I'm, you know, 10 years or so into working in industry that I finally figured out I am a simulation person. Like it, it took me a while to figure that out. And so you have to give yourself time. And I think the most important thing to remember is what you do in your first job is probably not what you're going to do for your entire career. Yeah. Everybody I know, they start out in one thing and then they kind of move around. They try different things and people might change jobs or, you know, focus areas every five to seven years. Um, and that's pretty typical. So it's just building up fundamental skills that you can translate. That's part of why I always really appreciated having the math background um, is that it has enabled me to tackle different application areas. Um, in some cases, if I were to go back and do something different, I would have taken more programming classes because um, I've had to learn a lot of that just on my own. And so I do wish I had taken more formal programming classes. You mentioned the fact that typically people move jobs every five to seven years or move companies or divisions within a company. Where mm -hmm. do you see yourself 10 years from now? Do you think you will still be in your current job? Um, that's a really hard question. I really hope so. Um, I really love what I'm working on now. Um, mm -hmm. And so if I could still be doing this in 10 years, I would be delighted. Um, but, you know, Two and a half years ago, if you had asked me, I would have said, I'll still be at aerospace. Um, and I mean, one thing that was nice about the Aerospace Corporation is that I was able to move around a lot within the company um, and get different experiences. Um, and so at this point, I know a little less what the future might hold, but that's part of what I'm getting comfortable with is that I may not necessarily know, but as long as I keep growing and advancing in my career, that's, that's what I'm focused on. Perfect. I know in your notes that you mentioned R&D project. Can you enlighten the students on what an R&D project is, what it stands for? Hmm. Oh, so R&D is research and development. Um, so, you know, and most big companies do this in some way or another um, that, you know, Apple just didn't invent the iPhone. It just didn't come out of nowhere that that started as a project um, and, you know, developing it before they decide like, yes, this is a product we're going to launch. So, um, and all companies will are basically investing in what's, what's the future. Uh, so it's work on something like that. Perfect. Um, what is the funnest part of your job at Apple? Um, I'd say there are a couple pieces. Uh, so one uh, is the people. I work with such incredible people that are so generous with their knowledge and their expertise. So getting to learn from them uh, and they're super fun. Uh, one thing I loved when we were back in the office um, is that my team had a really strong lunch culture that our entire team would go to lunch all at once. Um, and Apple has a really great cafeteria and we, so we'd all go together and get our lunches and we'd go sit outside. Um, and uh, one of our, our senior leaders always laughed when he would see us because it was kind of rare, but he'd be like, there's the team. They're all, they're all together having lunch. So um, just sort of the relationships we, we build up. And then the actual work I get to do is so much fun. It's so interesting and so challenging. And I have so much fun figuring it out. And when I build a simulation and I look at the answer and I'm like, oh, I think that's right. It's, it's really, I get so much joy out of it, which is why I work all the time. <laughs> We're going to take two more questions, and then I'm going to ask if you can please stay on. There's going to be a few that we haven't got to. If you can answer those um, just by typing in your answer into sure. the Q&A, we'd love it. But we're going to ask you two more. Um, if you didn't major in aerospace engineering, what do you think you would be now? Wow. Um, question. <laughs> so, like, does that mean, like, if I wasn't an engineer? Yeah. 
Like, what do you think you would have possibly went into if you didn't go into engineering? What was well, what, your first couple of years of college? Yeah. What were you thinking of? Well, honestly, when I went off to college, I thought I would double major in aerospace engineering and communications because I thought maybe I could do like public relations for an engineering company that, you know, since I like presenting and I liked engineering topics, I thought maybe I could talk about them. Um, but honestly, my first semester, the communications class was full, so I wasn't able to get in. And by that point, that first semester, I proved to myself I could be an engineer. Um, and so that was sort of a moot point. Um, but what my mom always thought I was going to be, she thought I would be like a magazine editor, like a fashion magazine editor, because I really loved fashion magazines growing up. Um, but I definitely like being an engineer. Excellent. And then last question, what coding programs do you know and which do you typically use in your job? Um, so I use MATLAB all the time because um, it, it allows me to do things very quickly and it has really powerful visualization um, attached to it. It can be a little bit slow, so it's not always great for like our bigger simulations. Um, I also over the years have taught myself Python and C++, um, but I'm not, I'm not a software engineer. Um, I have people on my team who are much more talented at that. And, you know, I tell them what my vision is for a simulation and what it needs to do. And then they, they go and actually build it for me. Um, but fundamentally, if you can learn a programming language, whether that be Python or C or C++ or even, you know, MATLAB, even though MATLAB is not a programming language, it still has all the key tenets of a programming language. And so it's kind of like a foreign language. Once you learn one, it's a lot easier to learn another because you understand the fundamentals of programming. Uh, so I think that's, that's what's important. Well, uh, Dr. Williams, thank you so very much for the time and energy you put into the presentation and helping the kids uh, to learn to define themselves. Um, for the students, we actually do have a small survey for you to accomplish. So I am gonna post this into the chat uh, for you guys.
Raina Duncan grew up in Connecticut, loving airplanes and attending air shows throughout the Northeast. She knew that at the age of three that she would be a pilot. Raina earned a Bachelor of Science degrees in Aeronautical Engineering and Aviation Flight Operations in 2009 from Daniel Webster College, along with a pilot's license. After undergraduate school, Raina began her career as a flight test engineer at Edwards Air Force Base. She then pursued graduate school using a smart scholarship from Cal Poly Pomona and obtained a master's of science degree in engineering with an emphasis in aerospace engineering. Most recently, she attended the United States Air Force Test Pilot School as the only civilian in her class, 20A, and earned a Master of Science in Flight Test Engineering. Raina has worked on numerous airplanes, including transports, fighters, and trainer aircrafts. The variety and ability to work on a complete aircraft fuels her passion for flight tests. Raina also enjoys spending time with her husband, daughter, and dog, particularly outside hiking and camping. Ms. Duncan, it is a pleasure to have you here. The flight deck is yours. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. The pleasure is definitely all mine. I'm very excited to be here today and get to talk to you guys. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit happy that it's in person because even just seeing the number of participants at the bottom here is a little intimidating, uh, but that's okay. We'll get through it. And with that, I'm gonna figure out how to share my screen, hopefully. And Hopefully I click all the right buttons. Okay. Um, so again, Mr. Fisher, thank you for coordinating this and putting this event together. It seems like an awesome event and I'm really excited that I get to be part of this. I'd like to also thank Mr. Victor Leclerc who also recruited me for this. So that's two for two for Victor. And uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. You're definitely a hard act to follow. So we'll, we'll do what I can. Um, I really appreciate your, your candid share and hopefully I can offer something similar. So first off, the challenges you take on make you who you are. Uh, there's a lot of you on this slide, and unfortunately, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking about me. So uh, I'll get I'll talk through some of the challenges that I've uh, I've faced throughout uh, my life and my career, how I've responded to them, and how those things have shaped me. Um, I ask that you. We're all different, right? We all come from different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, different, different life experiences. I'd ask that you kind of today listen for some of the similarities rather than focusing on the differences that you hear and uh, maybe see what you can take from that. Uh, also, everyone has different responses to different challenges and they end up in different places. Uh, I, I'm a, a big proponent of faith and I think I've ended up where, I was supposed, where I'm supposed to be. So, I think whatever road you take, whatever decisions you make, it's gonna work out, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> um, so as I step through this, I'm gonna talk about who I am now and what I do as a flight test engineer, where I came from, and I'm gonna pick three significant challenges in my life to kind of talk through a little bit. So with that, we're gonna uh, tell you a little bit about who is Shade and, and why do you call her that? So my name is Raina Duncan, I go by Shade, uh, I've worked at, uh, at Edwards Air Force Base as a United States Air Force civil servant. I'm a civilian. I'm not active duty. I never have been. I'm also not a pilot for the Air Force. Um, I'm a, a flight test engineer. I've been doing that for the last 11 years. And as Mr. Fisher mentioned, I uh, recently attended the United States Air Force Test Pilot School. Um, the class is split between engineers and pilots, about 50-50. About and uh, my class, 20 Alpha 2020, are, there's two classes each year. Um, so we started last January and about, about a year ago, we all shut down and uh, we switched to a virtual learning environment. And thankfully we worked out a way to continue class. And I went through, uh, through the pandemic in test pilot school, getting a, a master's degree. My class has, it was a fantastic um, group of us that got to go through, a very family-like. And as part of each TPS class, you put together a graduation video. One of my classmates happened to be sort of a, an amateur YouTubist. Uh, Match is his call sign. And I'm gonna play the trailer from our graduation video for you guys here, because you need you know the good video to watch some cool airplanes, right? Like that's part of what we're doing today. Have a little bit of fun, hopefully. So I'm gonna let this play and uh, we'll talk in a minute.
Mr. Fisher, can you let me know if this is coming through for you? Right. Uh, are we back on our PowerPoint? Hopefully. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that video kind of highlights um, the my 11 month master's program. There's one quick scene in there of somebody taking a test. Unfortunately, school was a little bit more of that, and along with all of the videos. Oh, and this is where I fail on the technical difficulties. Okay. So Test Pilot School is a, an 11 month program where it's about a master's class of work each week. So you learn, you have a, about four days of class and then you take a test. So it's a little bit condensed more than a, a full quarter or semester would be, but it's the idea is to get a, that high level education across in a week and move on to the next class. So we do that for about six months and then the rest of school is labs and flights and um, working in a control room. And there's, so there's all of that. There's the learning and that's exciting and airplanes are exciting, but it's also a lot more than that. There's a whole cultural aspect to it um, being, being part of the Air Force, even as a civilian. So that's where shade comes from. That's a call sign. And someday when we get to meet up in person, buy me a coffee or when we're all older, an adult beverage, and I will gladly tell you what it stands for. Miss Duncan, really quick, we cannot see your presentation. Ah, thank you for mm. letting me know. Resume share. I have spent a lot of time on Zoom in the last year, but on the receiving end, so bear with me. spinning wheel of death. <laughs> I can go ahead and share it for you if you like, I believe. Did you send me yours? Um, you know, when Ms. Williams mentioned that earlier, Dr. Williams mentioned that earlier, I thought, oh, I should. Uh-oh. All right. Well, I'm um, having some technical difficulties here. Um, so we are going to go ahead and... Um, let me see if she jumps back on here. My apologies. Uh, a little bit of a quick story. Uh, one of the reasons I truly uh, got a math degree uh, was because I wanted to be a pilot. Um, it's a, a very incredible thing for me. But unfortunately, these glasses back uh, before prohibited me from doing that. Um, the military did not allow me to be a test pilot or to be a pilot at all uh, to go even through flight school because of that. Um, but that was one of my dreams. Raina, are you back, Miss Duncan? There we go.
Now just unmute yourself, please. If you can hear me, Miss Duncan. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, my apologies for the, the delay. Let's move on. <laughs> so what is flight test anyway, or test in general? Um, uh, Dr. Williams talked about simulating and simulations and working through some of that and um, R&D, research and development. A lot of that happens in a laboratory or in a simulator. And what uh, companies or manufacturers do is they come up with a product and then they find out if it does what it was designed to do. So we can take a, a basic example like a toaster. So a two slice bread toaster has been around for a long time, but some manufacturer decides they want to uh, release a new version, the next model, and maybe it has a, a new ding or it has an electronic control panel. And they would uh, take a toaster in a laboratory environment or maybe just a panel piece of it and test it out there and see if it does what they want it to do. Does it does it do what it was designed to do? And then maybe you integrate that panel or the new ding or buzzer or whatever it is into a prototype toaster and you do some developmental test and you see if the toaster does what it was supposed to do. Does it still toast bread with this new, this new panel? Um, and then in the operational sense, does it do what the customer wants it to do? So maybe the customer wants to toast a bagel and this toaster only toasts bread because the, that little slice is not quite big enough to shove your bagel into. And that those that's kind of the world of test. Where I live is in this center piece, the developmental test. I look at, does it do what it was supposed to do? Um, sometimes we call this specification verification. So somebody came up with a list of requirements and then what we do in developmental test is see if it meets those requirements. On an airplane, this might be more like, um, does it fly as fast as it was supposed to fly? Uh, and then you would look at that starting in a, a lab or simulator environment, looking at the software that's on, on the aircraft. You move it to a prototype and then see if it works together in an integrated sense with the software and the hardware and see if it comes together to, to, to accomplish um, those requirements. And then once that's done, you have a production representative model that goes out uh, and is operationally tested. Does it accomplish the mission that you're trying to get through? Um, breaking that down a little bit more in that developmental test. So what, what I do, you can kind of split up into uh, two groups, flight operations and discipline engineering. There's a huge team at Edwards Air Force Base that accomplishes developmental test. I think there's something like 10,000 people that work out there and there's far more folks, you know, finance people and, you know, the people, even that down to the level of the folks that work at the gas station in Burger King that help us get the job done. Um, so this, this split is definitely missing some pieces. So there's a, a couple hundred folks that work in this flight operations and dis discipline engineering realm. Starting on the bottom for flight operations, uh, we can think of air crew and test conductors and test directors. Air crew can be pilots, that's pretty obvious, but there's some other folks that fly on airplanes too. Um, on cargo aircraft, you have loadmasters that help, that they are the experts on how you tie that air, tie down cargo in the back of that airplane, and even how you can drop it out in flight, how you do airdrop. Um, so it's not just pilots that are air crew. Uh, and then test conductors in the developmental test realm are the folks that help you progress through the test mission. They're the folks that are going to um, tell the pilot what to do, tell the pilot what the next step is, set the pace for the mission, and they're also gonna be monitoring some aircraft limits uh, and, and just making sure that the test runs smoothly. The discipline engineer folks are the ones who really dig into those specifications and see if, um, see if, it, if the aircraft does what it was supposed to do. In the dis discipline engineering realm, you can split that into flight sciences and mission system. Flight sciences is how the aircraft actually performs. So you think of um, the performance of the aircraft, how far it goes, how fast it goes, how long it can stay in the air. And there's um, flying qualities, how the airplane feels to the pilot, how it actually maneuvers through the air, the propulsion system, so the engine in the aircraft and how well that performs. Um, and then on the mission system side, 
You can think of things like the navigation system in the aircraft. Does it help you from getting lost? The communication system, do you have, do your radios work properly? Can you text other aircraft while you're in flight? Um, and then other systems like radar or weapons if you're, if you have those, um, and also electronic warfare. So there's a, a whole myriad of different types of engineering that live in this discipline engineering bubble. My last year at test pilot school kind of focused most on this test conductor piece. My previous 10 years or so out at Edwards was in the discipline engineering flight sciences arena doing performance work. And that's, that's really where my passion lies, is doing the data analysis behind uh, that specification verification. Does, does the airplane fly as fast and as far as it's supposed to go, as, as fast as everyone thought? Um, so that is what I do now. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here, starting with some awesome 90s pictures. There's a lot of thumbs up involved. Um, this is, this is me as a little kid, as Dr. Fisher, or as Mr. Fisher mentioned, uh, I grew up going to air shows every year. I have loved airplanes from a, a very young age and I continue to do so. Uh, and this, this is really kind of where my passion started. I luckily had some parents that were willing to um, put up with me driving, dragging them to different air shows. And, and you can see my dad on the ladder there with me. We're, we're definitely um, an airplane family, but this wasn't something that my parents did. This was something that they helped me learn about. What I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about is how I got from this goofy kid wearing oversized equipment to this slightly more fitting equipment in, in, in the last year or so. Um, so really what it is, is Raina's Road uh, to Shade. And the three big challenges that I'm gonna talk through are the potential for being medically disqual disqualified as a pilot, uh, pursuing higher education and deciding between flying and engineering, and then finally balancing uh, a family life with a career. So looking at test pilots, going to a, an intensive program like the Air Force Test Pilot School and still trying to be a mom. So first off, can I even become a pilot? That was, uh, certainly a, a big piece of, of my life growing up and having that dream from a young age. I, I know that's not really normal. Not everyone knows what they want to do at three. Um, there were a couple setbacks. At nine years old, I got glasses uh, and I was pretty certain that that was going to be a bump in the road, but was overcomable. Uh, the doctors told me, oh, you're a good candidate for LASIK or you can, you know, waivers are gla glasses are waverable. Um, and then at 11, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. I wore a back brace for about 18 months. And uh, even at the end of that, my doctor was still on the fence about maybe recommending surgery. I can uh, remember sitting in the doctor's office in tears when he told me that, because I, I thought that would be it. I would not have ever get the opportunity to fly in an ejection seat aircraft if I was gonna have back surgery. Um, so in middle school, kind of kind of already lost and not really knowing what I want to do with my life. My dad introduced me to aer aerospace engineering or aeronautical engineering, specifically Kelly Johnson. Um, he was the founder of Skunk Works, which is the, the Lockheed Research and Development Group. Um, he's a fantastic engineer and, and I uh, had a seventh grade science teacher who assigned us a project to go report on a scientist. And I asked him, well, can I do an engineer? And I, I think no one at, in my class at that time had any idea what an engineer was. And he said, sure, yeah, you go research them and you write the report. And, and that's really how I started learning about aeronautical engineering as an, an alternative to flying. But then we come back to this goofy kid. You can see here, she already has clip-on glasses and is already super excited about sitting in the backseat of this aircraft. Um, you know, dreams, dreams find a way, they die hard. And uh, I decided that even if I couldn't fly super awesome jets, I would, I would design them and I would be an aeronautical engineer. As I got through high school, uh, I still was looking at different schools to be an engineer, but this idea of flying never really left me. Um, 
I had two qualifications when I was looking for colleges. I'm sure some of you guys are in this boat, like trying to figure out what you want to major in and where you might want to go to school and how do you do all these applications. My, my two criteria were Boston. I wanted to be in Boston and aeronautical engineering. So there's only a handful of places that you can do that at, and I applied to them all. And I also got an ad in the mail for Daniel Webster College, and they told me I could learn to fly. They also had a two-year engineering program, and I thought, well, you know, if, I, if I'm a pilot, I'll be a better engineer. If I know how to fly airplanes, I'll be better at designing them. So my choice was to go fly airplanes, and I figured I'd pick up the engineering along the way. How do you make a choice between pilot and engineering? Well, you just take it on and you do both and see how it works out. I, um, I also really wanted to just do a four-year school. And um, I had a high school boyfriend at the time that, you know, we were, we were engaged and I wanted to go to school and come back home and I was going to work where I grew up. Uh, the Boston school that I got into for aero engineering told me it was going to be a five-year program and I said that's too much so I did the four-year program and ended up staying for six because they expanded from a two-year engineering program to four so there's there's the irony in that and I you know spoiler I didn't marry the high school boyfriend um, so moving on to how I I did get married and to my family and and my career today um, I met my husband out here at Edwards He's another engineer, um, another very, uh, I don't know, he's, I think, well, disregard. <laughs> um, the question is, how do I balance my family and my career? Uh, we were married for about two years. We were trying to get pregnant, and I realized that this might be a little bit outside of the scope for where you guys are at, or maybe it is a concern. How do I pursue a career and have a family life? And these, these are some of the hardest questions in life. You don't have to have a family. You don't have to do it that way. You get to choose what you want to do. And, and I'm here to tell you that we made a pro and con list for whether or not I should apply to test pilot school. And, and sometimes that's just the, the way to do it. You work out what is the best decision for you and your family at the time. We came to the conclusion that I would apply. I applied to school on a Friday and found out I was pregnant on Sunday. We... We decided that we had already made the pro and con list and we worked through it. So we'd see how the interview process went. It was a long process. It takes about a year to, to figure out if you've even made it into school and then it can be up to another year to start school. So I got the interview and I went uh, about five, six months pregnant in large clothes trying to hide whether or not I was pregnant and uh, just get through the interview. And when, when I when I got to the one-on-one -on -one interview part with someone that I had known for a long time, I told them I was pregnant and if there's any way, you gotta put me in that second class because I'd much rather do this with an 11 month old than a five month old. And that that is what happened. Um, I have a two year old daughter. She is fantastic. Uh, and there is no way that I could get through any of what I'm doing in my career and in my daily life without my husband, my daughter and my dog. Uh, the, the three of them are a fantastic asset. And I think the really only way that you can balance a family and a career is with a with the proper support system. And that doesn't necessarily just mean your your whole your single family unit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my TBS class was amazing. We had a big group of folks that any of them would put to get, you know, put together and you watch the kid or help you out with a meal or just whatever you needed. And you have um, you just need a support structure in whatever form it takes, whether it's family, your immediate family, your extended family, your friends, your coworkers, uh, as Dr. Williams mentioned, like these folks are, these are technically coworkers, right? But they're also, they're my extended family. And there's no way that uh, I could have gotten through the last year without any of them. So with that, I'm gonna close on the, the balance of challenging uh, balancing your, your family life, sometimes it's just going to be hectic. And I'm here to tell you that you cannot do it all despite whatever it looks like. Sometimes your life and your Christmas card is a little bit more chaotic. Uh, the house may be a disaster. The dishes may not be clean. And sometimes you eat cereal for dinner and that's okay. There's a, 
there's an acceptance to doing it all. And you just have to understand that sometimes you can't. So um, with that, I'm going to open up to any follow on questions. I really appreciate the time here. And if you guys have any any questions that we don't get answered today or future questions, please feel free to, to reach out and email me. And I'd also like to put out a plug there for my classmate Match Productions. There's more there's more videos out there. Um, comment, like, subscribe, whatever you whatever it is you guys do. And uh, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we do have uh, some questions for you, um, but wow, uh, uh, being a pilot always allows you to see so many things from a different perspective. The challenges you face as a pilot, I'm sure, helps you to find and face other challenges that arise in your life. Um, thank you for sharing your challenges with us here today, Raina, and I am so glad that that goofy kid in you found the strength to face her challenges and keep fighting for what she really, truly wanted. I do appreciate it. We do have a couple questions here. Let me go ahead and get to them. Uh, the first one is, what was the first thing you saw or did that made you know that you wanted to be a pilot when you grew up? Um, one of the things that's always fascinated me and still fascinates me today is jet noise. So hearing those like big jet engines at air shows when they come screaming through and like you can feel it in your chest, that's, I, I actually told them in my interview at Edwards that if I could just hear jet engine noise every day, I'd be good. <laughs> that is wonderful. Ravino is saying, thank you so much for your service. Um, he knows you're not in the military, but still just the testing of it to make sure that our pilots are safe. Um, but what is the fastest aircraft you have ever flown or helped build? Um, I, I guess, uh, well, an F-16 or an F-15, uh, they can definitely go faster than speed of sound an F-15 a little bit faster. Um, I, I've, I've definitely gone over probably, probably 1.2 Mach, I think is probably wow. where, where my limit is. It's, uh, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Wow. Well, there are some other questions that are actually um, in there. We, we're running a little bit over, so I'm going to go ahead and have you type answers back to those students if you can I stick on them. a few more minutes. Uh, for the students, we do have, and I do apologize for the technical difficulties um, during this presentation, and also uh, in and Dr. Uh, Dr. Williams, I, I forgot to make yours a checkbox, um, so I have fixed it for the surveys for the rest of the presenters, but there was one question the kids can only answer once, so Dr. Williams, uh, I will try my best to, to help get you some more feedback from that. But for uh, this presentation, guys, we do have a workshop number two survey for you guys to fill out. If you can please take a couple moments, we will get started with the next presentation right at uh, 10 a.m., which is going to be my Natalia Cuenca on empowering you. And so thank you guys so much for being here and being a part of this. Miss Duncan, thank you so very much. And uh, we'll be back, guys, in a couple minutes. Please take uh, two minutes to fill out that survey. Thank you.
Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, um, for workshop number three, finding your personal mantra, uh, Natalia Cuenca is a materials engineer at Marathon Petroleum. Originally from Colombia, Natalia is a firm believer that math and science are lang and are languages that transcend all borders. She holds a bachelor degree of science in polymer engineering from Georgia Tech and enjoys spending time outdoors soaking up the beautiful Southern California weather. Ms. Cuenca, we thank you so much for your time here today and helping uh, our students uh, find their path into engineering. The floor is yours. Thank you. I am gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. So let me know when you can see it. All right, are we good? Thumbs up, perfect. So hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I wanna say a huge thank you to both Dr. Williams and Ms. Duncan for the presentations earlier. I am so glad that this is being recorded because I feel like I need to go back over the weekend and really sit with what you've said um, and analyze what I want and what I want, where I want to go. And so my hope um, in today, I'll be talking about creating your own mantra and how shape tomorrow can begin by empowering yourself today. Um, as Ken mentioned, he kind of already tackled my whole introduction. <laughs> A little bit about myself. I am originally from Colombia. My family moved to the States when I was nine. I always wanted to be an engineer and in the Southeast, one of the big engineering schools is Georgia Tech. Uh, so I went on to go and get a degree in polymer engineering from Georgia Tech and I'm now a materials engineer at the Los Angeles refinery. Today we want to talk about self-empowerment. What is self-empowerment? And I hope in a bit for this Session is to give you a couple of tools so that after you leave today, you can feel you've, these are tools that you probably are already using, maybe um, kind of unconscious, unconsciously, but I want you to feel empowered and be very um, intentional about using these tools in the future. So first, let's get the lay of the land. What is self-empowerment? Well, empowerment is defined as the process of becoming stronger and more confident especially in controlling one's life and claiming one's rights. And I think the key word here is process. I wanna encourage us starting today to think about self-empowerment as a journey, as opposed to a destination. You know, you're not gonna to leave today and check self-empowerment off the box and let that be that, and then go back and do it again next Wednesday. It's not like that. It's more of like a muscle that you have to exercise. And one of the tools that you can exercise this with is goal setting. Um, so what does goal setting have to do with self-empowerment? Well, I think we can use a tool from psychology to help us link the two. The expectancy theory tells us that our motivation to complete a goal is a product of things. One, how much you value your goal, how invested are you in seeing it come to fruition? And two, how much you believe that you can achieve your goal. Now notice that none of this is predicated on your actual proven ability, tangible proof that you've done it before, but rather your perception of your abilities. And that's really where goal setting comes in. You know, Dr. Williams earlier talked about this, um, how after she did enough things, after she tackled problems long enough, she kind of had proven to herself that she could do it. And that's what you're doing every time you set a goal. You're uh, setting goals, setting something and the fact that you achieve it, you develop a little bit of trust in yourself, a little bit of an ability to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's really key to self-empowerment. Another tool, since we're talking about being comfortable being uncomfortable, another tool in this self-empowerment journey is identifying your fears. And I think that that's particularly important given today's audience because Studies have shown that women often judge their performance as worse than it actually is. The opposite is true for male parts. Now think about that for a second. In a study done of surgical residents, these are doctors in training to become surgeons, the students were asked to give themselves to grade themselves based on how they perceive their performance to have been. The women graded themselves a little bit worse and the men gave themselves a little bit higher grades than what the faculty had actually given them. And what's most interesting about this study is that for that class, the women had actually outperformed their male peers. Why do you think that happens? Why do you think we sometimes sell ourselves short? Well, by now you may have heard of this phenomenon, the imposter syndrome. 
The imposter syndrome is a phenomenon which capable people are plagued by fears, by insecurities, a fear that maybe you're not enough, you can't cut it. Um, and I think in this instance, fear is particularly important to identify because it can be very dangerous. Fear doesn't always have to show up as anxiety where we have physiological response to it, where we shake or tremble. Fear can be something that lulls you into inaction. And I'll give you an example of how I saw that playing out in my real life. Um, a few years after I started working, I initially started working at a consulting company and I love my job. But about four years in, I realized that I was ready for a new challenge, itching to tackle something a little bit bigger. And I started looking for new positions. And as I was looking for these roles, I got really discouraged because I was a four year engineer at that point. And all of the postings I was seeing were for engineers that were, were asking for engineers that had 10 to 15 years experience. So with four years, I thought I'm too junior. What's the point in applying? You know, I didn't want to, I, I, I hate rejection. I think we all do. And I didn't want to be rejected. I also didn't want to seem, um, you know, dull. You know, why would you apply to a position that's calling for someone that has 10 to 15 years experience when you only have four? Um, thankfully for me, though, at that point, I was also reading this wonderful book, Lean In. If you haven't read it yet, I highly encourage you to pick it up. I plugged it last year when I did the talk, and I'll plug it again because I think it's that important. Um, and in this book, Sheryl Sandberg, the author of the book, she talks about how women are very unlikely to apply for a job where they don't they meet every single one qualifications listed. Well, men, on the other hand, hand are likely to apply for them because why not? What's the worst that can happen? And I thought about that and I thought about the situation I was in and how I was reluctant to apply for a position that I didn't think, uh, for which I didn't think I meet the qualifications. And my friend Colin, on the other hand, and this is a real life, this actually happened. My friend Colin, on the other hand, also was looking for jobs, very similar roles to, roles to the ones that I was applying for. And he also had about the same amount of time of experience and he had not applied or landed a job similar to the one I was looking for. So, I took Cheryl Sandberg's advice and I leaned right in. I went ahead and applied and I sent a note to the recruiter saying, you know, I know that I don't necessarily meet all of the qualifications, but I wanted to express my interests. And um, if something comes up along the way that better meets the qual that for which I'm better qualified, I'd love to be considered. Much to my surprise, a few days go by and I get an email from the recruiter letting me know that, hey, you know, we actually weren't able to find um, anyone that had the 10 to 15 years experience and projects you worked on actually really aligns with the responsibilities we want this individual to take on. So can you come in for an interview? Um, long story short, came in for the interview a couple of um, discussions later and I landed the gig. And in that process, I really learned a valuable, valuable lesson that I still go back to. Um, it's true what they say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And two, I almost let fear hold me back from applying for a position and getting an opportunity that has opened a million doors for me since. And so today, before we kind of move on to talking about the other we're going to talk about, I want to encourage you, just like Cheryl Sandberg encouraged me, to think about the things that scare you. What are the things that you would do if you weren't afraid? Is there a club? that you would join, but maybe the idea of showing up to the meetings by yourself without any of your friends makes you uncomfortable. Is there a leadership position that you think you could do great in or grow into, but you know, doing a speech in front of your peers and asking for their vote is not that appealing? Um, is there a team or a part in a play or an activity you'd like to do? That it sort of pushes the boundary where you're at. I want you to think about that, ask yourself, identify it, and then go do it. Gary, I know. So how are you gonna do that? You've achieved, you've identified goals, you know, you're working on getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. So the last tools I wanna to talk about today are establishing your motto and finding your mantras. And I think sometimes these words motto and mantra can be used interchangeably. But today I'll argue that they're actually pretty different. A motto, for example, is a short sentence phrase that can encapsulate the beliefs um, or guiding ideals of an individual, family, or institution. So for example, 
The Cabrillo High School motto is success in the West, pride of the West Side. And that sense, that really sets the long-term vision and kind of momentum for where you will want to go as a team. In my personal, in my professional life, I like to think that my motto is where there's a problem, there's a solution. For me as an engineer and in my line of work, I'm often asked to look at problems that don't have, uh, to. Um, people come to me with a problem, they say, what happened? Why is this broken? Or how can we make this better? And um, unlike in math class, I too was a big math nerd. I love math. And one of the things that I loved about it was that there was always a discrete or a very concrete solution. It either worked or it didn't. It was black or white. And what I found, what made me a little uncomfortable when I got out of school was that in life and in work in particular, there isn't always a clear solution. Um, but as an engineer, I've developed this motto where there's a problem, there's a solution because of that one, 100% true all of, it's true all of the time. But also, even though the solution may not be clear or may not be elegant or may not be readily apparent, there always is. And it's always, for me, it's always been about shifting focus or asking a different colleague, a colleague to weigh in and give me their perspective. There's always a way around it. Um, so that's kind of my guiding principle as an engineer. A mantra, on the other hand, I think has more of a, a present, more of an immediate, um, sorry, I'm trying to get my timer right. Uh, <clears throat> a mantra, on the other hand, I think has more of an immediate purpose. Um, so the definition of a mantra is a word or sound repeated to aid in concentration. In the movie Inception, which I don't know if you guys have watched it, it's a great movie, I encourage you all to watch it. Leonardo DiCaprio and his team infiltrate people's dreams to steal secrets. And because the dream world and the real world can sometimes seem so, so similar, they have these trinkets they carry, they call them totems, in this case his is a spinning top, um, that let them know whether they're awake or in the dream space. Um, so in this scene, Leo takes the spinning top and he spins it. He knows that in real life, if he spins the spinning top and it stops spinning, okay, he's awake. That's what, that's what um, the spinning top is supposed to do. But in the dream world, if he spins it, it spins indefinitely. And I think a mantra can sometimes function in a similar fashion. When you face obstacles, or at least when I face obstacles or when um, things don't go the way that I expect them to, sometimes we have a tendency to kind of have a, go into a little bit of a tailspin, you know, have negative self-talk or, oh, I, the mark, I can't, that was such a silly mistake. Um, you know, how am I going to get to the next step that I wanted to do? And even though it's important and I encourage, I think it's really healthy to identify how you missed the mark and why we missed it. I think it's also more productive to focus on moving forward and how you can take those lessons to move forward. And a mantra can help us kind of snap out of it. A mantra, the definition that I like to give is a tool. It can either be a word, a sound, or image, whatever gets you out of that space you're in. Um, that can bring you back to reality. Reality is that whether they're in your, were in your control or not, they're no longer in your control and they happen. So now you have to shift focus to move forward. So what I wanna do with the rest of our time today is I wanna work on helping us develop a mantra and helping you create your mantra. And maybe you already have one, maybe you already have, as we're working through this, you'll find that there are things that you already kind of run to naturally, but I want, um, I invite you to continue to workshop those and see if maybe you can identify more. I don't think you can ever have too many things help to help you get out of a run, more, more or less. Um, so if you haven't already, I'd like to invite you to grab pen and paper or have something you can write on. Um, so I'll give you a second or two to do that. And once you're ready, I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about a goal that you want to achieve. And I want you to imagine yourself, envision yourself achieving it. I want you to be fully present there. I want you to think about what does it look like that you've achieved your goal? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? How do you feel? What are the emotions that this achievement is bringing up in you? Who is with you? 
What are you doing? Now focus on the sounds, the colors, the emotions, everything this image brings and hang on to that for the next 30 seconds. All right, okay, now open your eyes and grab your pen and paper, whatever writing tool you have, and do a brain dump. Everything that that image brought to you, I can, you can even draw things, but go ahead and put that all on paper so you can look at it. What, be specific, what did you see? How did you feel? What emotions came up? Are there words that popped into your brain? Who was there? Color, sounds, image. Write it all down. I'm gonna give you another minute. Okay, um, now look at the whole page, look at this uh, kind of brain dump that you've created and you to package it up. Uh, you know, we talked about how in Inception they have these little trinkets that are totems. They're not bringing these whole libraries to let them know that they're in the real world or, or not, they're, they're sleeping or awake. So how can you package this up? How can you put it into a nice little um, tidy mental cue that you can call upon when you're facing an obstacle. I'll give you a minute to try to do that. Okay, so about 30 seconds, seconds left. Um, as you're putting these together, think about one thing I should have mentioned earlier is I want you to think about using positive words, using open-ended big words that can help you kind of get back to a positive place and reshift your focus. Things like limitless, infinite, action words that um, incite something in you. I can, I will. Um, think about including those. And uh, as you're kind of working through this, I'll tell you a story about um, when I was in school, I, my first year in school, I, one of my really good friends, she had been a lifelong runner. She'd been in the cross country team in her school and she loved running. On the other hand, running at all. Um, and she asked me if I wanted to run a half marathon with her. Now, I didn't know what a half marathon was, but I said, yeah, sure, that sounds fun. Uh, and later I found out that a half marathon is 13.1 miles. And as someone that had never run more than a mile before, that sounded like 13.1 more than I should have been running at the time. And, but nevertheless, I agreed and we trained for it. And, um, you know, speaking of goal setting, that was something that I just never thought in a million years that I would want to or could do. And um, the fact that I was training for it was really cool. I, it was really neat to see me run two miles and then three, and so on. And, um, you know, the day of the race comes and I'm so excited to finally do this big thing that I had been wanting to do, that I had been training for. And uh, mile one, mile two go, and it's exciting. There are a lot of people and everyone's cheering you on. Uh, mile three, mile four, okay, we're still running. Mile six, mile seven, okay, I'm still running. Mile eight, mile nine, oh my gosh, I'm still running. Mile 10 comes, and um, you probably heard of this thing called the runner's wall. 
and I was looking down on my feet. I'll never forget. I look up and I thought I was actually also running into a literal wall because all I saw was this huge hill. And I remember at that point in time thinking, what am I doing? This is not okay. I am not meant to be running this much. I'm not an athlete. I am not a runner. What am I doing? And we're climbing this, this hill. And I remember my legs feel like lead. There's sweat, but the sweat is caked on, you know, when it's so dry. And I, my lungs are burning. And I'll never forget this, this sweet, sweet gentleman who was someone's number one grandpa because that's what his jersey said. He just yells out and collectively, everyone was just miserable running up this hill. And he yells out, it's all flat if you're looking down. And everyone, it was like a collective sigh of all of these runners just acknowledging, we just need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And for the rest of college, and really even now, I still think about that when I, it's really late and I just can't seem to solve a problem or solve a work issue that I'm dealing with or when I'm under pressure, when I'm being asked a solution right away and I just can't seem to find, kind of get my, my bearings straight to, come to, get, to put together a solution. I think about that. It's all flat if you're looking down. And to me, that's, I mean, obviously at that point in time, it just meant, hey, we got to get to this hill. But I come back to that and I think, yeah, it's all about just kind of, keep going, keep going, keep going. And as you pro progress, eventually you'll get to where you want to go. Um, so, okay, I think it's been more than one minute. I would love to hear what your mantras are. If you want to submit that through the Q&A or comments, um, they won't be by to you specifically. Um, I, I'll give you another one that I've been using lately. I, over the last year, you know, the world has changed a lot and for me specifically, I um, have seen some close friends lose people that they're really close with and experienced something very similar in my life last year. And it really caused me to uh, look at my priorities and kind of shift my priorities a little bit and really assess where I want to go, what I want to do and why I want to do it. And as I've been working through that and kind of thinking through that, one of the words that I keep coming back to is the word commit. Um, this idea of committing to being fully present where I'm at, committing to being a better daughter, a better sister, a better friend, a better colleague. Um, so lately, whenever I've kind of faced or kind of when I'm in a crunch or in a bind, that's a word that comes to mind, the word commit. And I think, okay, it's worth it to go the extra mile or, okay, it's okay, I'll you know, stay up a little later to get this done so that my coworker can have this one piece so he can do this piece for the, for his job. Um, so that's something that's been helping me. If you guys would like to share yours, I'd love to hear what you came up with, uh, but no pressure, I know that this is something really personal. Um, and so moving forward, I wanna encourage you to use it. Um, come on, use what we did today, use this exercise and do another version of it, maybe take a little bit of longer time. We kind of condensed it into a very tight amount of time, um, but use it and let it evolve. You know, I talked about how at the beginning of school, I was using this, it's all flat if you're looking down. And now I just condensed it down to one word and different mantras will help you get out a different mindset and can help you get into a different, into a more productive headspace. So let it evolve and um, yeah, use this as a tool in your future goal setting. In closing, I, um, you know, Again, I think it's really commendable that you're all here and I wanna encourage you to keep developing, to keep on this self-empowerment journey by continuing to set goals that align with your motto or your vision of yourself. I want you to, I wanna encourage you to keep developing mantras and finding tools um, that promote positive self-talk and encouragement. And we, we talked about how self-empowerment is a journey and not a destination. So. As with any other journey, it's great to have company. Um, I think it's awesome that you guys are all showing up here, that you're all here today. I wanna to encourage you to encourage each other. You know, we're each our own, we can sometimes be our own worst critic. So I wanna encourage you to encourage each other and lift each other up. Um, I wanna thank you for letting me share this space with you today. And um, before I leave you, and before I leave, I wanna leave you with, um, this quote by Michelle Obama that I think really encapsulates everything we talked about. Don't be afraid, be focused, be determined, be hopeful, 
be empowered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and I do want to, uh, you know, thank you so much for letting our students know that their perception of themselves is so important for them to achieve what they want to accomplish. We are so honored uh, that you have taken on the challenges of moving to another country and thriving and sharing your story with us here today. We're also glad that you express your interest in applying for that job and creating the opportunities that you now have. The hills of life are definitely a struggle, but if you do keep working on them, guys, you will make it to the top of the mountain of STEM or any mountain that is posed in front of you. My mantra, by the way, has always been go hard or go home. And always remember, failure is never an option. So I might as well give it everything I got. And that's what I live by each and every single day while I'm teaching, uh, being a husband, being a father, uh, being a friend, uh, being anything is, is just go hard or go home. And, and I rather go hard and, and make sure that everybody around me uh, feels the love that I have and everything else. So Natalia, thank you so much. Uh, for the students, um, we do have a, a survey. If you guys can please, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen really quick and post this into, uh, if you guys can please uh, take that survey in the chat, we'd greatly appreciate it. Natalia, we do have a couple questions here. Um, uh, for a statement, actually. Uh, one mantra is, I can and therefore I will. Um, so that's yeah. Ravino. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have a question here. Um, did you have a mantra when you were a teen? If so, do you remember what it was? Yeah. Um, you know, I was, as I was putting together this presentation, I thought about this. And I, I think one thing about this, identifying these tools, that's great is that it's probably something that you're already doing and just not aware of. And so as I was thinking about what I had used in the past to kind of get me through it, through things um, and help me tackle challenges, I, um, I thought about in high school, I, um, I did crew. So it's like a rowing, I was one of the rowers. And one of the things teach you um, one thing, ways they get us to kind of row faster is um, a race is typically uh, 150 to 200 strokes of, in the boat. And the cox and the individual that um, drives the boat, that, that, yeah, that maneuvers the boat will call out something called power 10. And a power 10 is 10 strokes as hard as you can in the middle of the race to give you that extra bump. Um, and I think talking to friends that ran track and talking to friends that uh, did swimming, these racing sports, there's something similar. But I think I, when I was in high school and prior to college, and even now, I often think about this idea of a power 10 when you're kind of like in the thick of a race, when you're in that space where you're, it's, you're not at the beginning, you're not quite at the end, you're in the middle and you're reaching a wall, having a power 10, a little bit of an extra jolt to get you through that. So that's something I used. Perfect. Well, there are some other questions inside the question and answer. If you can please take some time to answer each of those for the students, we'd greatly appreciate it. And then we're going to take about a minute break here, and then we're going to come back with our keynote speaker, Ms. Kennedy Garcia. Thank you, guys.
sticking to the schedule here. I know some of you might not have had enough time to finish that survey. Uh, please feel free to finish it as I am speaking. Um, Kennedy Garcia is transforming businesses and lives every single day while wearing a crown, both figurative, figuratively and literally as Miss California USA 2021. A Stanford STEM grad, Ms. Garcia has been honored by two White House administrations with Presidential Service Awards for her efforts as a mental health advocate, raising awareness regarding the impacts of the gender dream gap and its correlation to teenage suicide, while also partnering with community leaders to implement programs that increase access to mental health services and leading programs that give flight to the dreams of our youth. Kennedy is passionate about creating the exposure and leadership development opportunities for girls in STEM and provides scholarships through her organization, the Dream Academy by Spiritual Boss Chick for graduating seniors. Ms. Kennedy Garcia, it's such a privilege to have you speak here today and help inspiring the students listening here. The stage is now yours. Thank you for that amazing introduction. You have been leading this journey for these kids and you are amazing and what you guys are doing is just phenomenal and I'm honored to be part of it today. So you guys have heard from a list of powerhouse women in STEM. All day, all morning, it's been amazing. I've been listening on myself, taking my own inspiration from some of the stories that have been shared. I hope that you are taking it all in and thinking of how you will define challenge and empower yourself and others from here on out. I'm excited and honored to be your keynote speaker for today, primarily because I want you to leave this event with the understanding that there is greatness inside of you. And if you believe in yourself, set a vision, equip yourself for success and work hard, you can become who you really want to be and accomplish anything. Not a single person in this world is here by accident. Every last one of us were created with a purpose and everything you need to manifest your greatness and reign in this life is already inside you. Sometimes the messiness of the world around us though can cloud our judgment and determine things that we shouldn't let it impact like who we really are and what we should focus on. I came to know this at a very early stage in my life. Matter of fact, I was a 14 year old junior in high school who had just been diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. I'll never forget the day this diagnosis was shared with me. It was the first time I ever saw my six foot three law enforcement badge carrying gun toting father cry. It was also the day that he imparted these very critical words to me. He turned to me and said, everything we need to beat this already resides inside of you. You are strong, you are beautiful, you are a queen and cancer isn't ready for you. And I thought, wow, he really believes that. So maybe I should too. So many lessons have derived from that season of my life. It was in that moment that I committed to never defining myself by a situation or something that I was experiencing or something just happening to me, but instead defining myself from a place of power, a place of confidence and a place of hope. So I resolved to be exactly what my father said I was, a queen. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, a queen is not just a woman who reigns in England, <laughs> or wins a title at a pageant, although I've done that too. A queen is also the most powerful chess piece that each player has, able to move any number of unobstructed squares in any direction along a rank, file, or diagonal on which it stands. And let me tell you, no one, I mean no one, can play a better game of chess than me. You see, I know who I am, I believe I can conquer all things and no curveball thrown my way is too hard for me to hit it. Because of this, I've been able to successfully move in powerful directions, including through and over obstacles. How you define yourself is critical because it will determine 
what you believe about your capabilities, your strengths, your limitations, your resilience, and ultimately how you achieve what you want in life. Believing that you are one of the most powerful pieces in the game of life is only part of the secret sauce. You have to know what you want and be willing to act. Remember the day I told you about, the one where my dad cried? Well, there were three physicians consulting with each other at the foot of my bed to solve a problem, a cancer they'd never seen before in a person my age. I decided right there in that moment, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to solve problems that would help make people's lives better. And I set out on a mission to accomplish that. I was determined that even cancer couldn't stop me. In the midst of a health crisis, I set monstrous goals. Things that my friends said I was crazy to even think I could achieve that. And I put a plan in place to achieve every single one of them. In one short year, I was in total remission, moving my sentimental keepsakes from my childhood bedroom, along with my identity, beliefs, ambition, and vision for my life to college. That vision included being a pediatric anesthesiologist. And although my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering would have served as a wonderful foundation for medical school, can you imagine having a doctor who would faint at the sight of exposed organs or too much blood? <laughs> yeah, I can't either. <laughs> Which is why after I passed out, not once, but twice during my senior shadow week at the hospital trauma center, I decided to choose a different career. <laughs> Life is messy and will always throw you a curveball. Sometimes it happens right when you think you have it all figured out. I hope that you can be flexible and willing to travel new routes to get to your destination, but never, never lose sight of who you are and what you wanna accomplish. I knew I wanted to help solve problems and that would allow people to live better lives. And despite my curveballs, I still managed to build an entire career doing just that. So it looked a little different than I originally planned, <laughs> but that's better than being the doctor who faints in the operating room and is totally useless. <laughs> Instead, I've developed software used in those surgical rooms apps that have the potential to prevent suicide and legislation and laws that resulted in expanding access to physical and mental health care services on college campuses across the United States. My personal model has always been never settle. Even in times when the world around us feels super messy, remember there's greatness inside of you. You can't settle. Every experience, every challenge, every interaction, every life-changing moment, coupled with every pivot in response to those challenges, your beliefs, the intentions you set, and every goal you achieve is part of the process of becoming you. I will always be a queen, the most powerful piece in this game called life. So I want that for you. I want you to be able to tap into your power today with everything that you've learned from everything that you've heard. So we're gonna do a little activity together. Do me a grand favor and pull out one piece of paper, blank, nothing on it, and a pen or a pencil. And I will give you just a second to do that. Okay, now that you have your paper and your pencil, for a second, close your eyes with me. Imagine that you are walking down the street in your very favorite neighborhood, the prettiest one you've ever seen, the one you most desire to reside in. See very clearly what that neighborhood looks like. While you're walking down the street, 
Find the house you'd like to live in. Look at it. Notice its details. Now you can open your eyes and begin drawing your house on the paper. Make sure that the frame and the structure is exactly how you pictured it. I will give you a moment to start your drawing. As you're drawing that, I want you to think about what that house looks like from every angle. When your eyes were closed and you walked towards the house, what did you notice about it? When you walked around the house, what did you see on the side? When you were halfway around it, what was on the back? <laughs> Notice the details of the house as you continued walking around and put that into your drawing. Now that you've gotten your framework and your structure and the foundation of this house complete, I want you to come back to where you started at the front of the house. You have to have a way to get in there. So go ahead and draw your entry, if you haven't done so, into the house. All right, so we're gonna close our eyes one more time because I want you to think about very intentionally what is inside the house. As you close your eyes, think about what you would see in this perfect dream home that you're creating for your future self. Okay, open your eyes. And now, curveball number one is coming at you. I want you to explore the inside and draw what you saw in your house. But this time, you can't lift your pen or your pencil from the paper. Draw the inside of the house as you explored it and noticed it when your eyes were closed, but don't lift your pencil or your pen from the paper. Now that you're inside the house and you're starting to draw everything that you see, in this desired future state, you run into a secret door. Draw what that secret door and that secret room looks like. What's inside of that secret room? What do you see when you step in there? You're the only person who has access to the secret room. Draw whatever you would like to put away behind the secret door. Now it's almost time to leave the secret room. So wrap up by making sure that you've drawn the most important thing that belongs in that room. Remember, your pen has not left the paper, so you should still be connected to the paper. Do not lift your pen or your pencil.
All right, now that we're done with our secret room, without lifting your pen or your pencil, I want you to make an exit through the entryway to get back outside of the house. Just a line to get through the entryway. And when you get outside of the house, you notice that there's something missing in the yard. So without lifting your pen or your pencil, draw what you believe is missing from the front yard. Okay, and pens and pencils down. So a couple of things that I wanna share with you about what you've just done and what it represents will help to enlighten why we actually did this exercise. First, before we get started, I want you to celebrate the fact that you did this activity and I'm sure you did it well. I hope one day to be able to see the drawings that were created because I think it's gonna be telling about what your future is gonna look like. <laughs> And I'll explain that. So when you look at the drawing, is it different than what you saw with your eyes closed versus what you produced on the paper? I can bet the answer is yes. The lesson in that is that the vision that you have can come to fruition, but you will have to go through the messiness of life to make that happen. Don't let the messiness keep you from dreaming, having a vision, and headed in the direction of your goals. Believe in yourself and know that you can get there, even through the mess. The structure of the house represents who you are as a person. The entire process represents who you're becoming. The house is the only part of the picture that you had full control with your eyes open and your pen without constraints. You have that same power to create who you wanna be in life. So create the best version of the person you wanna be and believe you're capable of reaching that goal. The messiness inside the house represents the curveball that I mentioned. You will always have curveballs in life. Embrace a never give up attitude. You can even adopt my motto, if you want, of never settle. Curveballs will forever come your way, but you need to make sure that you continue to keep your dreams alive and persevere. The secret room represents your vulnerabilities. Some might also say that your secret room represents your fears. Equip yourself for success and remove self-doubt and other things that might sabotage your ability to make progress. Share who you truly are with people. Be authentic because you will never grow if you're not true to yourself. I would love to hear what your houses look like and what you learned from this experience. I thank you for spending this time with me and I'm excited to see what the future holds for you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Kennedy. We greatly, Kennedy Garcia, we greatly appreciate that. Um, I will tell you that, uh, first of all, your choices to keep fighting and your ability to keep pushing forward are so valuable for our students to hear about. Many of them have gone through a, a lot of turmoil, especially over this past year of COVID. And uh, your words of encouragement and, and just enlightenment on what they can do is so powerful.
Uh, your work to help all kids find uh, the love for themselves and realize that every experience just changes them in some way. I will tell you, my house was, I, I try to make it a little bit of a castle. It was a castle in my head, um, but it definitely did not come out that way um, with my drawings on my paper. Uh, but inside my house had a simple couch on it, um, a place for me and my, my lovely wife to just sit down and relax is, is what my, my goal in life eventually would be. And so uh, I do thank you for taking us through uh, that program and, and uh, that, that just that activity and allowing us to kind of go deep inside of what, uh, you know, who we are and what we want out of our lives. It was very inspiring uh, to hear your story and very enlightening uh, to go through that activity. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, so let me go in and do that. And so uh, was that some kind of astral projection that you were trying uh, to come up with? I wish it were that complex. <laughs> <laughs> it really is just a way to be introspective without making it feel like you have to solve the world's problems in five minutes, right? Look deep within yourself and understand and become self-aware of your strengths and your opportunities, what you want in life, and create a plan to achieve it. Uh, Ravino did make a comment that my house has a lot of space, which gives me a sense of peace and relief. So thank you for that. Um, uh, what kind of, was that a kind of activity like manifestation type thing, which you just answered? So I'm going to go ahead and, and take that one off. Um, so mind blowing, the concept of a secret door has put my mind in a different perspective. Amazing. So thank you for that. And in terms of your life, um, what would you have um, in your secret door? that you think you would have, Miss Garcia? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, my secret door probably has, um, hmm, worry. I have for a very long time dealt with trying to balance the, the worries of the world. Again, my whole you know, premise is I want to solve the problems of the world, but I'm deeply empathetic. And so I typically feel things when people are going through problems or going through their challenges. I, I feel those with you. I celebrate those wins and I celebrate the lows as well. And so I have a tendency to sort of worry about things that I don't have control over. So in my secret room, I would probably put all of the worries that I have um, in there so that I can... Uh, hide the worries from the world. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's very similar to why we do what we do here at Cabrillo High School to try to solve all the problems that really the, the faculty and staff, which are amazing people here at Cabrillo High School, uh, we try our best to help every single problem that really we, uh, that kids face, even though we don't really have uh, the pure opportunity of, of helping them solve it, that sometimes it's something um, that they have to face on their own. And through events like this that give the students the strength and the courage to really go after who they are and what they want and how they want to be defined is, is why we do what we do. So I, I do thank you for that. Um, uh, what do you see in your backyard or rather the back part of your house that was missing? Oh, so, you know, what's interesting is when I did this activity with a group of kids, we were all in person and I, I drew my house and I drew um, the swimming pool that sits in the backyard that I actually have. But next to it, I put this big like entertainment space and um, like a DJ booth <laughs> and all of this stuff. And they're like, wait a minute, how was that missing? And I'm like, because there was no fun in my backyard. I drew it very serious. And I think that speaks to just the engineering mind that I have, <laughs> it always goes to, you know, the serious side of things, but I wanted to create space for fun. And so, you know, who doesn't have a little bit of fun when you throw on some music and you get your little favorite dance in there, yeah. right? We can, <laughs> so that's what I added to my backyard. Excellent, excellent. And, and, um, <laughs> they said, yeah, exactly like mine. So that was funny when you're making that comment. So in terms of your life and, and your progression, um, what would be the three, have your three words that have defined you, if you had any, how have they changed over the course of your life? Oh, um, I think 
how they've changed is when I was younger, my three words that defined me were always about what I did. They were about actions I've taken. So if you asked me this question, maybe right after undergrad or even grad school, I would have said, you know, my three words were, um, you know, engineer, they are, um, you know, change maker, they're, you know, influencer and not influencer like, you know, what the new school <laughs> influencer is, but a person who influences, right? Um, and now, if you ask me that question, my answers are different. They're more about feelings and who I am is um, an extremely empathetic person who cares deeply about the world. And um, that is what enables me to be those three things. That's what enables me to do the work that I do. But the work that I do is not who I am. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Uh, was your college life difficult? It was. Um, I was a first generation four year university student. Both of my parents went to junior college and I sometimes I believe my dad only went so that he could continue his baseball career <laughs> at that time. Um, but I um, didn't have a family who understood the experience of being away at a four year university. It was also during a time where there weren't a lot of people who looked like me at the campuses that I attended. And um, finding community was very difficult. I think when I graduated undergrad, I was one of one, the only woman of color, now that I think about it, in chemical engineering out of that department specifically. And so it was challenging. It was challenging to relate to my professors who also struggled to relate to me. Um, it was also challenging because I didn't ask for help because I was a super smart kid and school always came easy to me until I got to college. Right? Um, and I wasn't good at asking for help. And I, I think I got my first C in undergrad and I called my parents and I was crying and my dad hung up. <laughs> He was like, you're crying because you got to see. Yeah, I, I was really, really hard on myself. And I think I probably made college harder than it needed to be because I was this perfectionist and wanted to just do well. I had a lot of pressure on my shoulders. I was the first person on my mom's side of the family to graduate from college. So there was just a lot of self-imposed pressure that I placed on that experience and made it tough. All right. Um, who has been the one person in your life that motivated you more than anybody else? Oh, that's definitely has to be my mom. Um, I'm a daddy's girl. I talk about my dad all the time and he was my best friend and we had a great relationship. He's no longer with us, but my mom was such an inspiration to me she owned her own bakery, so she was an entrepreneur, uh, but also a stay-at-home mom and very involved in our activities and in raising us and being there for us. And um, she was the person who had this, I can do anything, you, you know, I set my mind to attitude. And so not only did my parents reinforce those thoughts by saying it to me all the time, I actually had an opportunity to be in a household where I saw it modeled. And that was super important, more th so than she probably even knows. Wow. All righty, ladies and gentlemen. Well, there um, uh, is a link inside of the chat. Um, for the keynote survey, if you guys can please take it to give us some feedback uh, for Ms. Garcia, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're going to take about a five minute break for you guys to accomplish this task. And then we're going to come back with our women in STEM panelists, uh, where we open it up to questions uh, for them. And so Ms. Garcia, thank you once again so much. Ms. Natalia Cuenca, uh, Raina Duncan, and Dr. Ashley Williams, thank you so much for your time and energy uh, in this workshop presentation series this morning of our 
Cabrillo High School Women in STEM event. We greatly appreciate your time. And each of you will be receiving a thank you package. Give me a couple of days to get that mailed out to you guys uh, for everything that you've done, the inspirator, inspirational words, the words of advice, encouragement, um, in helping our students of Cabrillo High School find out who they are and what they want. So thank you once again. We're gonna go ahead and uh, I'm, I'm gonna post up the next part. Uh
All righty, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much. Uh, so today, this is going to be our Women in STEM panelist. Uh, we have Dr. Nicole Navu from the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, who's an applied physicist, Alyssa Lai from Edwards Air Force Base Structures Flight Test Engineer, Amy Fisher of Edwards Life Sciences Biomedical and Electrical Engineer, and Keiichi Okori, uh, Cal State Long Beach Computer Programming Major, uh, Joan Meisner from Kennedy Space Center, NASA Aerospace Integration Engineer, engineer and Haley Serbaugh, the Northrop, Northrop Grumman Mechanical Engineer working on the F-18 fighter jet line. And so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here and start to ask um, some questions that have already been posed. Um, so give me just a moment. Um, and so, uh, when you're talking about, and this one's going to be, we're going to start off uh, with Dr. Uh, first of all, let's go in and do introductions. My apologies. Um, I want each of you to take about 60 seconds uh, to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Um, and so we'll start with you, Dr. Nicole Navu. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a PhD in physics. So as Mr. Fisher said, I now work at Stanford University at the Slack National Accelerator Lab, and I get to work on particle accelerators. So think The Flash, or if you saw the Spider-Verse movie a few years ago. <laughs> um, and I'd like to share the three words that I think define me. So I'm pretty passionate about what I do. I really love it, which makes the hard times easier to get through. Um, I'm curious, I like to learn new things and solve problems. And finally, I'm pretty persistent. I know sometimes that word has a negative connotation, but I think most STEM professionals will agree things don't always work the first time. So it's important to be persistent and push through those failures and realize like you can find a solution to your problems if you keep at it. Okay, so thanks for having me. Excellent. Looking forward to your questions, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joan Meisner, go ahead. Joan, are you there? Let's go to Haley Serbal, please. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I have this little mic thing. Um, my name's Haley Serbal. I work at Northrop Grumman Engineering. Um, I work on the F-18 fighter jet production line. So when something goes wrong there, I kind of help them figure out the best way to fix it in terms of not only structural stability, but cost effectiveness as well. Um, I graduated Cal State Long Beach, bachelor's in science and uh, civil engineering, but I'm working in aerospace currently. It's a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, I would say my three words would be inspiring because a lot of my motivation does come from me wanting to be the best I can in order to inspire not only my younger brothers and sister, but also maybe the people around me and anybody that I interact with, like uh, outreach programs like this as well. Strong, I would say this very much ties into persistence that Nicole like mentioned. Um, it, you have to be strong, I think emotionally um, to one, make it through life and two, especially to make it through engineering um, in a healthy way, I think. And I think my third word I would pick is kind. I do enjoy like helping people. I do enjoy giving back to communities, volunteer work, donating, all that kind of stuff. And it's nice to meet all of you girls. Excellent. If we can ask all the panelists to go ahead and just turn their cameras on, we'd much appreciate it. You could stay muted until you're talking, but that way we can see your faces. We'd love that. Okay. Amy Fisher, would you like to go next? Sure, yes. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Fisher. I have a double bachelor's from Cal State Long Beach in biomedical engineering and electrical engineering. I currently work at Edwards Life Sciences. I'm a research and development engineer in our critical care division, which focuses in advanced patient monitoring for uh, cardiac output. Um, and I'd have to say that my three words, I think align with some of the people here also. Um, strong is one of the ones that I would, uh, see for myself and making sure that I'm always hardworking. Um, I would say inspiring is another one. One of the things that has always helped me is inspiration from others. And I hope that I'm able to give that inspiration back to those around me and um, caring as well. Um, I feel that one of the biggest reasons why I'm in the medical technology industry is to be able to give back to the community and leave the world a better place than I came into it. And um, that is something that I care about a lot. <laughs> um, so those would be my three words for you guys. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And Keichi Okori? Hi everyone, I'm in Keiichi. So yes, I am a current senior at California State University of Long Beach. I am also the CEO of United for Youth, a nonprofit organization, and I'm your current reigning Miss California USOA. I would say the three words that define me would be goal-oriented because typically I believe that setting goals gives you uh, will and power to fight for something you believe in and go towards your goals and dreams. I would say that I'm also very passionate because I believe passion is something that really drives the fire under you to uh, go for something that you want to and find that that will to do better within yourself. And then last but not least, I would say that I'm very energetic because I typically like to light uh, brightness into a room or make everyone feel very happy and excited to do whatever it is that um, I believe that they can do or I can do myself. And I'm really excited to be here with y'all today. And you definitely do that. Thank you so much, NKG. Uh, Alyssa Lai. Hi guys, um, my name is Alyssa Lai. I have a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering, but currently I am a uh, structures flight test engineer over at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Um, for my personal mantra that I prepared for you guys, um, this is something that I tell myself or remind myself every time I get overwhelmed since, you know, engineering, it's, everyone knows it's not easy. Um, it can be very challenging at times. What I tell myself is, um, you know, uh, take it one step at a time, even if it's a tiny step, you know, you're still closer to your goal than you were before. Uh, very excited to be here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And Joan Meisner, I don't know if you can hear me. If you are, are on, I saw that you just jumped back in. Um, can you go ahead and turn your camera on and, and your mic on and tell us just a little bit about yourself, please? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi, sorry, I had some internet issues down here in Florida. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Joan Melendez Meisner. I am a systems integration engineer at NASA. And um, I have a dual bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and chemistry and a master's degree in systems engineering. And I'm extremely excited to be here. I apologize for being a little bit late. Um, Florida weather is a little bit unpredictable, so I apologize about that. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and start with the questions. We do have one question up, um, and this is gonna start actually for you, Joan. Uh, if you had a chance to go back to college and major in anything else, would you, and if so, would you change what you majored in and why? So I got into chemistry and chemical engineering a little bit different. Um, I actually did not want to, I, I wasn't planning on being an engineer when I first started college. I actually wanted to be a doctor. Um, I was lucky enough to intern at a hospital. So I saw a whole bunch of blood and needles and I quickly realized that that was just not the field for me. But while I was thinking that I want to be a doctor, I was taking a lot of chemistry, biology classes. So that's what led me to major in that. Um, I enjoy what I do. Uh, however, if I, if I had a chance knowing what I do now, I'd probably major in something uh, like mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering because I'm more in that field. I don't really work in the lab a lot. Um, but, you know, I'm also here to say that just because I majored in those degrees, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be niched into the lab. You're able to, you know, as an engineer, if you like something else, like for me, I like getting my hands dirty. I like to work with the planes. I got to work on the actual hardware. So I would shadow engineers and say, hey, I, I prefer your job. You know, I'd ask them like, you know, what kind of um, experience I needed to be to have the job that they had. And I had a lot of good opportunities to move into the more mechanical aerospace role. Um, so, you know, I'm a living proof that you don't have to stay in one niche. But if I did have the opportunity to go back, I'd probably do an aero or mechanical degree. Excellent. Um, Amy Fisher, the same question. If you had a chance to go back to college and major in anything else, would you? And if so, what would it change it to and why? So I actually have a very similar story to Joan where I went into college expecting that I was also going to be a doctor and that did not um, bode very well for me except my struggle was chemistry and I realized I did not like that. I did not want to take multiple years of chemistry. Um, and I had started out actually as a biomedical engineer in college because I wanted to not go in as a undeclared major because pre-med at Cal State Long Beach is an impacted study. So um, I was already taking my biomedical classes. I absolutely loved it. 
Um, and I do love the job I have now, um, just the same. I love my electrical engineering also, but I think if I were to do anything different and go back and make changes, being in the field that I am now and having um, in the like medical industry in general, a lot of what we work on, especially at my company is very mechanical in nature. Um, we focus on heart valves. And um, so I think for me, one of the things that I always try to do is try to learn more on the mechanical side. So I think I, if I would do anything differently, it'd be go back and instead of having an electrical focus with my biomed degree would be have a, having a mechanical focus instead. Okay. Um, Dr. Naveau, oh, uh, with the, the three words that you gave us at the very beginning, uh, when you introduced yourself, how has your definition of you changed as you've gotten older and more experienced? Yeah, so I definitely would say um, I become more persistent as I've gotten older. I think when I was younger, it was, uh, I had a lot harder time maybe sticking with things or thinking that I could do something as long as I spent enough time at it. So that's definitely changed over time. And I think that's a skill like was mentioned in one of the talks earlier is you just learn that you can handle these problems. And that's not always easy to overcome that hump of thinking or having confidence in yourself, right? But you know, it's something you have to practice at and, and work on. And so that's definitely changed for me over time. Excellent. And Kei Chi, um, how has COVID affected your time at Cal State Long Beach, especially during your senior year here um, over there with your senior design projects? So COVID has really allowed uh, myself and a lot of other students going through this to adapt and realize that uh, being in a situation where we're all together and we have to find a way uh, to uplift each other. So I've been able to do that. I've been able to use my platform to help others and inspire others to continue to pursue like their goals. For me, it's uh, getting through college and making sure that I get my degree and pursue my goals. So it's been um, a pure image of self-growth and adaptation for me. And Haley, same question to you. How has COVID affected your job and what you do at Northrop Grumman? I think that's a very um, interesting question, especially for a production line, because obviously when you're building something, you can't necessarily do that from home. Um, so for our teams, we have the, all of the technicians have to be on site at all times. So we really had to enforce like di social distancing and mask wearing, very strict regulations on that. Um, and for as far as the engineering side goes, my team has we have to have at least one person on site at all times just for basically emergency purposes because there's always something out there that you kind of need to see in person to get the correct understanding of the situation so we have a rotation going right now where we'll have one person on site and the rest of the people working from home and the person on site really is um, like a focal point for all of the manufacturing teams and the engineering teams to kind of come together and get the information that they need from the site and distribute it correctly to everybody else. Excellent. Um, Alyssa Lai, how does influencing the next generation of engineers help you at your company and your job? So influencing the next generation of engineers is really like, it's one of the biggest things that we as like the Air Force really look for since they'll, um, they're like really our future, right? Um, I, we really need um, like a fresh new mindset, a fresh new batch of people to really be excited and, um, you know, motivated to do the work um, uh, so that we could, we as um, the Air Force can um, really push and like be superior um, in air power. Excellent. Haley, we got another question for you. What are you currently working on at your job, if you're allowed to share? So it's mostly the F-18 production line. We build the back half of that jet. Um, GE builds the engines, and then Boeing builds the front half, and, which involves the cockpit and everything. Um, so within building that, there's problems every day. Um, people drill holes where there's not supposed to be holes. They put things in the wrong places. <laughs> there's all sorts of like very simple problems. And I think if anybody's ever really tried 
to build something like they have those robot kits. So if you've ever tried to like build that robot kit, tear it apart, build it again, you'll see that even you yourself, even with the instructions there next to you, you'll kind of make little errors every once in a while. And this just kind of magnifies that scale. So anything like that, we've been having issues with um, parts not lining up lately. Um, they've broken off chunks of pieces lately. <laughs> It's, it's been very interesting. So if you're uh, if you're a problem solver, working on an assembly line will give you lots of problems. <laughs> NK Chio Corey, was there ever a time you failed at something that you deeply wanted to succeed in? And how did you teach yourself to rise above it? Yeah, I mean, just recently I had um, another pageant that I had to attend and I didn't win the crown, which is okay. And uh, the thing that I learned is that, you know, you never really will succeed at something the first time. Maybe some people do, but those who don't have a better chance of um, succeeding the next time and learning something that they may have never learned if they succeeded the first time. So I take uh, great pride in my failures because they show me the weaknesses that will allow me to be a better and a stronger person. And I believe this is something that we all should incorporate and uh, relax when we fail, because that's a way for us to become stronger people. Yeah, to learn from this is a rat. That is perfect. Joan Meisner, same question. Was there ever a time that you failed at something you deeply wanted to succeed in? And how did you teach yourself to rise above it? Oh, absolutely. As a chemistry major, I failed organic chemistry. Like that right there was just, you know, I, I opened my eyes and I, you know, thought, thought to myself, like, is it, is this a path that I can actually finish? And so, you know, I deeply wanted to pass it because not only it was my degree, but I wanted to teach myself that, yes, I can pass it. And, you know, um, how, how, you know, she, the previous panelist eloquently said it is you, you teach yourself your failures because, you know, failing is just a stepping stone to success. What I usually tell people on my social media or whenever I do these panels is, you know, it's okay to fail. It's the way that you pick yourself up and you just keep on going because it's something that you want to achieve and it's a goal in life of yours, then you have to keep going towards it. Um, how I overcame it was, um, I don't know if uh, you guys have ever heard of like a brag sheet. So whenever I have, you know, imposter syndrome or uh, something that I just, I, I don't think that I can achieve because of X, Y, and Z, I write down all of my accomplishments that I've done so far. You know, I passed all of these other classes. I was able to gain an internship while I was in college, even though I, pa I failed organic chemistry. So I put all of those things down on paper and then I overcome that because I say, I've come so far thus far, I can't give up now. So again, failing is just a way of life. You just have to pick yourself up back up and keep going. Excellent. Dr. Naveau, have there ever been times when you questioned yourself and the goals in which you have set? Oh, yeah, definitely. So <laughs> there's definitely times uh, in college or in grad school, even even very far in, you know, like a few in years into college or a few years into grad school where I thought, like, do I really want to do this? Is this stress or, you know, this difficulty that I'm having right now, is it worth it? And I think always at the end of the day, for me, it was like, I really enjoy what I'm doing, which makes it easier, like I mentioned earlier, to get through those hard spots. But that doesn't mean the hard spots don't happen, right? So there's always those moments where I question, like, am I good enough for this? Can I get through this? You know, and, and the answer is yes, you definitely can. If you want to do something, you can get through it. And like, it's not going to always be easy, but it, it's okay. There, you know, reach out to your support group or whoever is in your life that can help you get through that moment. And then you, if you really are passionate about something, you'll find it's worth it in the end to work through those issues. Excellent. Haley, um, mentoring and seeking advice is something that basically everybody does in their careers and even growing up. How, how do you identify times when advice should be trusted or when it should or should not be trusted? So this is tricky, and I think this is something that you have to learn through your own experiences is how to read people and how to understand what their underlying intentions may be. Um, because not, and it's, it's hard to say this, but not everybody in the world is there to help you. And you have to kind of figure out who those people are and who the people who will help you are. And once you identify the people who will help you, 
and the information and mentorship that they can give you it can be boundless truly um if you and this goes even with like news outlets like if you try to think about why they would be telling you a certain thing how it would benefit them and if those benefits are i guess from true intentions or maybe deceptive intentions those are things that you're if you ask questions and ask the right questions you can kind of figure that out by a case by case basis um and i think especially with an engineering asking questions is always a good thing um i know some parents yell at their little kids when they're why the sky is blue or why is the ocean blue or stuff like that but those are questions that are that should be celebrated and should be encouraged and i think that's something that we should carry throughout life excellent um joan meisner how how have your priorities changed throughout your life and how has that affected you in your career um so i am i feel like my priorities change on a daily basis i set myself i have so many goals i i always tell myself i should have just been an actress and been able to play so many different parts as a lawyer one day an engineer another day a doctor another day cuz i just have like endless amount of goals so you know that throughout my life hasn't changed because i've always been a very ambitious you know child and then now an ambitious uh, adult And so what I try to do is I try to set myself a, a list of goals every single week whether it's you know to submit a project or you know something like that every single week and then I also set myself a goal for the entire year um and so that way it keeps myself grounded but at the same time it gives me something to look forward to and so that's what I you know if you have goals please write them down because you know as um the previous question with with Haley you know you're able to talk to mentors with your goals you're able to achieve those goals by talking and networking to get work um so you know again it hasn't really changed i'm very um you know going back to the question i'm just all over the place i just want to achieve everything and i want to be everything at the same time so um you know set your goals and be able to write them down on a piece of paper All right. Uh this one will go will go with Amy. Were there any blocks that seemed to be too difficult for you to overcome and needed influence from others to help you overcome them? Um I mean, yeah, I mean there are, <laughs> there are things on a very consistent basis that I have a difficult time overcoming. Um and it's uh something that when I started out in my career, um right out of school, my main degree is electrical engineering for example, and I went right into the biomedical industry. And after a couple of years, I thought, you know, I I got my electrical engineering degree, that's what I wanted to focus in in the medical side of technology. and i um thankfully worked for a company and had a boss that was able to like push me down that route and um but because i've had so many years out of practice um on that side of things i'm constantly learning and um building myself and i am very thankful to have the wonderful team that i do have at work and a great group of people that are very willing to push me and just like throw me out into the deep end of the water and give me time to figure things out and make sure that they're there as my support group to help me learn um but that is something that I hope I never get over in my career because it really is something that I strive to always want to keep learning and growing so I hope I never overcome all of those blocks <laughs> so Alyssa Lai do you have any core values in life and how has that shaped your current career path and position so One of my core values is of course to always do the very best that I can. Um and with that, uh I kind of carry that all throughout my school year, um seeing that I you know always got good grades. Um or all I I always strive to get good grades um really help to get to where I am in my career. So without it's important to keep school in mind um when you're thinking about your future um in your future career path because you know it is one of the things that um they do look at um not only grades but also um uh doing hard uh working hard in like um extracurricular activities doing all those different things um so as long as you're doing the very best that you can um i think that will take you very, really far in what you want to do and can really help you in um whatever it is that you're striving for Excellent. And this is going to be basically the last question, but what I'm going to ask each of you to think about is one word that you live by and then any final words of advice 
uh, to give to the students uh, that are on this panel or discussion today. Um, so one word that you live by and the final words of advice. And uh, we're just gonna kind of go in order from how I see you on the screen. So we'll start with Haley, if you can. I was hoping I wouldn't be first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one word to live by, I think, I think my word would be try. Um, because as long as you try, you're doing what you need to be doing, if that makes sense. Um, and as long as you try, you have the option to fail, of course, and you have to forgive yourself for those failings and try again. Um, and then my last words of advice are, you know, if stick to what you want. So if you want a life um, that's revolved in the STEM field, stick to that and all of the hardships and the struggles will be worth it and you'll be able to work through it. You've, hear, you've heard stories from every woman here earlier of all the struggles that they've gone through and everybody has their own struggles. And for me, I came from a very broken family. I lost my father when I was in the beginning of my second year in college. And that I, I thought that was gonna break me, but I found, I found a way to push through and to just keep chugging along. And as somebody said earlier today, just keep putting one foot in front of the other and you'll get there. And Keiichi? I would say confidence. Uh, as women, you know, we're always, for a very long time, we've been told to be, you know, silent and stay behind the man and not really voice our opinions. But this is a new day and age and confidence will take you however far you wish to go. And just by stepping into your own light, being yourself, understanding who you are and what you're capable of really puts you above the average. And um, being confident within yourself goes a long way in understanding what you're capable of. And uh, that's the word that I want to leave you guys with. Perfect. Okay, that's a lot. Um, I would say um, my word would be faith. You know, as long as you have um, faith and you, you have a reason to keep going I say like just always keep that in your mind and um, use that as your own motivation to keep going um, things will get will get hard things are never easy for too long so as long as you you know keep your faith you know you're 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 bound to get to um, your end goal and do whatever it is that you want to do um, as for my last piece of advice you know when things get I, I think I'll, I'll go back to um, the mantra that I said in my intro, you know, just, you know, even when things get hard, just put your foot right, take, take it eat a step at a time. It'll get overwhelming at times, but, you know, you'll get there. Perfect. Dr. Naveau? Yeah, so I want to go back to um, passion. It might take a few tries, you know, but if you find what you're passionate about, you'll be happy working in that field, you know, for however many years and, and find the people you're passionate about working with, like the people around you as well. And, and also remember that, you know, maybe you might not think of someone as a support system, but if you reach out, you might find that people are very perceptive to helping you reach the goals that you set for yourself. So just remember, you can do whatever you want to do. The question is not if you're good enough, right? You already are good enough to do whatever you want to do in life. So just remember that and keep moving forward. Perfect, Joan Meisner. My word would be support. So support one another. You know, I came just like Haley from very humble beginnings. And, you know, I had, I'm a first generation student that graduated college and my, you know, I wanna help all of you. I want to, you know, I'm not the only one. There's so many people on this panel. There's so many people all over that want to network and help you achieve the goal. Cause one of my main uh, mantras is, you know once I get to where I wanna be, um, you know, at the top, I want to pull that ladder down for the next person to follow in my footsteps or make their own journey. So, you know, make sure that you find your own supportive system, especially in women in STEM, you're going to, you know, need your core support group so you can ask for advice. And, you know, if there's anything that comes along the way, any hurdles or struggles that come along the way, having that supportive system will help you. So that would be both my word and piece of advice. Perfect. And last, but definitely not least, Amy. I think that the word that I would choose is courage. 
there is always a lot of hardship. There's always a lot of struggle. Um, there's a lot of times where you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling down and low, but to have that courage to constantly take those next steps and to constantly move forward and push yourself and challenge yourself, um, that's really what's gonna get you to keep going on. Um, and if I could give any piece of advice, um, kind of along with what a lot of these other women have said, it's that you know that self-doubt is there, it helps to push you, it helps to um, help you learn how, like about yourself and get you to see who you really are. Um, and one thing that's helped me is that I've been a perfectionist a lot of my life and no one, per no one is perfect. Um, you're never going to be perfect and good enough is very much always going to be good enough. And, um, that's, that's what I would leave with you guys. Perfect. Well, Haley, Nicole, Joan, NKG, Amy, and Alyssa, thank you very much for the words, uh, for the answering the questions today uh, during this panel discussion, being a woman in STEM. Uh, I greatly appreciate everything that you've done here today for the students that are on here. Um, I am going to finish up uh, with the presentation, guys. Thank you so very much for joining us for Cabrillo High School's seventh annual uh, Women in STEM event. We do have a final survey that we would like all um, all of you to take, if possible, let me stop sharing and type that into the chat very quickly. Um, if you guys can please uh, do this final survey, it is a survey monkey then rather than a, a, Google, a Google form, um, but that just gives me that capability of, of looking at the data a little bit more clearly. Um, but we do thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the CED Advisory Board for your time and energy in helping to putting this event together, especially Angelica Lukin and Victor Lukin, uh, two graduates of Cabrillo that have gone on to do some amazing work and who are behind the scenes in this um, adventure of women in STEM today, uh, their bravery, their courage, uh, what they have done to help put this together um, is instrumental. And I do greatly appreciate both of you for the time and energy you've spent. I also want to thank Long Beach Unified School District for allowing us to have this event to inspire students, not just at Cabrillo and Long Beach Unified, but all around the United States. Um, once again, uh, we cannot keep running this event without the great support of companies. So thank you to Marathon Petroleum, Matson, Edwards Air Force Base, Custom Inc., Space Force, United for Youth, Cabrillo Gems, ACOM, uh, Cal State Long Beach, and Honda for your great support. Guys, I thank you all so very much. Uh, thank you for your time and your energy. Students, have a wonderful day. Professionals, uh, bless you for all the words of advice and, and courage that you've shown here and, and taking our students um, to, the to the mountaintop of STEM. Guys, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.